Good evening, everyone. Welcome to episode six of the Fanboys Anonymous group meeting podcast. I am your host, the owner of fanboysanonymous.com, Tony Mango. And with me on the panel for this evening's festivities, we have two different fanboys here. Chris Dace. Hey, hey, hey. And Tom Jackson. Blue. This meeting has been officially called to order. We're going to talk about our review, our opinions our perspectives everything in relation to amazing spider-man 2 the movie just came out in america yesterday we are recording this the second of may so uh we are a little bit later than some other countries i don't know why they're still necessarily doing that but they are so we had to wait and (laughs) that's why this is not up uh sooner because we're not watching some cam footage thing or anything like that we're watching an XD, which is the same as 3D, but $2 more. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, first impressions, basic ideas, so your overall thoughts about the movie, and then we're going to break things down and discuss lots of little details here and there. I liked it. I thought it was very entertaining. I liked it better than the first one, and I am going to end up seeing it again. And that's good because I was planning on seeing it again anyway. And if it would have been a bad movie, then damn it, that would have been terrible. But uh, that's my point of view. And we are disagreeing about some stuff before we even did this. So I know that we'll get positives and negatives from everybody. Tom, what did you think? Overall impression? Well, I have to be honest and say I went into this planning not to like it because some of these days is just trendy to go in already hating it but to be I, I gave it a fair chance and i think this franchise skipped the glorious spider-man 2 and went straight to a horrible spider-man 3 ouch it was just not great <laughs> days overall impressions meh <laughs> I, just going into it it was it was cool to see but you know i walked away just kind of like yeah that was a movie it's okay <laughs> So we have uh, a green light, a yellow light, and a red light from us. And that's going to really uh, span all the, the different things that we can talk about. One thing I wanted to say in a, in a positive sense is I thought that this movie had a better job of pacing than the first movie. The thing that I really didn't like about Amazing Spider-Man 1, I mean, there's you know the little things I didn't like that bothered me quite a bit because I'm a big Spider-Man fan. Um, and then there was little things that bothered me and all that. But the, the one main thing as a movie that I didn't like about it was I thought that they crammed way too much in there and tried to make it mean too much at the same time. The main issue was there's about like seven characters that have some kind of a relationship with Peter Parker in the first movie. And they all only have like one scene with him before they like die or the movie's over or whatever. (laughs) Like uh, uncle Ben has literally, I think one or two short scenes where he calls Peter an asshole basically, and then gets shot. And then it's like, Oh my God, uncle Ben, you're so perfect. Why did you die? And it's like, no, he was a fucking asshole in this movie. And he didn't say the one line, right? Come on. With great power. There comes great stuff. I don't remember what the rest of that line is. Like here. That was another thing that bothered me is they went out of their way not to do certain things. Like yeah. they went, they had to do a different costume. They had to uh, make these same things that were a part of the origin, but they didn't want to do it. So they did like this half assed, we're going to purposely not do it kind of thing. And that stuff bothers me. But the pacing with that, with not just Uncle Ben, but it came with Lizard. I mean, they had like two conversations and then it was like, oh my God, my, my big mentor that we maybe spent like 25 minutes talking over the course of my entire life. Uh, you turned into a bad guy and my semi girlfriend that I've stalked, her dad is dead. No, you well, hated maybe, me. If you stumbled on the secret recipe for Peter Parker, he only spends time with people for like 10 minutes and then that's <laughs> it. So He's just kind of like, I got a skateboard. Go do some other shit. <laughs> but with this movie, I thought that they did a better job with that. I thought, um, when they introduced Harry Osborn, they already had built in the idea that they were friends before, so they could kind of skip that a little bit. But he didn't need to have that much of a relationship with Max Dillon. He could just... I mean, that actually helped it, even, that he had only met him the one time, and then he was just like, ah, oh, I can't remember your name, shit. Oh, Max, yeah, sure, Max. Wait a minute, you're a bad guy. Uh, now I'm going to fight you. Uh, so 
I like that better. Now that we had Gwen Stacy from the first movie, that built up some of the groundwork and we could just go right into their relationship. And another thing with the pacing issues that affects the characters that really bothered me the first time around, but they, I think that they fixed it this time. Aunt May really got screwed in the first movie. Yeah. There was really like no interaction with her and Peter and outside of the egg scene, which I like, I was cute. Um, they're really, it, he just kind of seemed like a, a little asshole to her. And in this movie, you could actually see that they were a uh, surrogate mother and son that they loved each other in some kind of way. So I liked that a lot. I thought the pacing was a lot better. What do you guys think about that? Was this more of a triumph? Was it the same kind of thing? Was it worse? Was there some kind of an issue with they didn't spend enough time on this character, but they really should have kind of thing? Dace? I think it was done very well. Um, like you said, they, they built a little bit more on the characters to give us more feels when it came to it. Uh, I like the fact that Paul Giamatti wasn't in it that much, even though... You know, he he was he's been heavily featured in all the trailers and everything, but at the same time, they they didn't oversaturate with villains. They did, I think they did that just right. They had three villains. They could have went the route of uh, way too much, but I think they did it just right. Tom, um, well, I think it was a long movie. It was a two and a half hour movie, and I thought I think there was a lot going on. I thought the first act was really strong. Like I got into that movie. 10, 15 minutes in, I thought this th- this was going pretty well. But for me, the second act, it was just trying to do a lot, a lot of character work with a lot of different people, trying to do like three different themes. And obviously, we'll get to the, the big moment at the end, which I thought the big moment should have kind of heralded the end of the movie, but it kind of heralded the end of the second act instead. And then we had this additional 15, 20 minutes that I'm just not convinced was necessary. I think I know where you're going with, with that, because I had somewhat of a similar... Uh idea yeah I, I think i couldn't appreciate what they were trying to do at the end just because i mean again the big moment at the end of act two was just so heavy and honestly something that hasn't really been been done in superhero films um that i i think trying to which i understand why they just try to start rebuilding something there because especially for this to be a family movie that's a heavy moment but to try to like go straight into it like this pseudo action scene uplifting he's back on or off the horse however you say that it just didn't really work for me. And I thought Act 2 got really – I just got, thought it got really muddled because we, we had, had the Electro story bubbling. He had his weird thing with Harry bubbling. He had his weird thing with Gwen bubbling. His weird thing with his aunt, the weird thing with his parents. Like I, I just – I thought it was just trying to do too much. Well, let's talk about some of those different storylines going on. Um, uh, I guess let's break it down character-wise. With the Gwen thing, one – issue that I had with Gwen's storyline and I can understand why they did it but at the same time I kind of think maybe they could have figured it out a different way if they I I don't want to say something as uh, um, condescending as if they would have thought about it another 20 minutes but I think that they could have gone a different route instead of having her main story be that she has some kind of a scholarship and she might move to England and that's something that's really putting a timetable on their relationship. I think they could have figured out a different thing to do and kept the same idea of, well, they won't, they, uh, you need a bigger commitment to this than just breaking up and getting back together and everything. Is that something from the comics that she went to Oxford or anything? I don't remember ever coming across that, but then again, I'm not the best scholar when it comes to comics. Do you guys remember anything like that happening? I haven't read the death of Gwen in a while. Whoops. Well, there you go. I haven't read the Gwen Stacy arc <laughs> in a while, but um, I remember it was a lot of this. Will they? Won't they? Because it, it act, they actually did a nice little nod to it because their one big moment was when they were together on top of the Brooklyn bridge and they embrace and they finally decide, yes, they will. And then chaos ensues. Apparently she was dressed the same way that she was in the comics when they did that storyline right. too. Well, I, I think they took a lot of the, um, at least the essence of the story. I, I think that was the best part of the movie, to be honest, partially because they're dating, you know, in real life. So I think their chemistry was a little better. I just think the problem with having her, the will they, won't they factor be her, like just unbridled, unblemished, incredibly uprising success be that it, it just made Spider-Man seem very reactionary. And there's kind of two generations of Spider-Man fans. One generation has that Parker look that Peter Parker's just kind of this loser that can't get ahead. 
Whereas I think growing up in the 90s with the animated series, with the Tobey Maguire movies, it's more that he's this guy that's divided between responsibilities. But to me in this movie, it's just kind of he's this like wayward kind of loser who can't commit to anything. Meanwhile, she's this up and coming rising star kind of thing. Like she's the valedictorian instead. It's not that he has to be valedictorian. It's just that she's she's out of college. She's already somehow she's already working on the side as an eighteen year old girl at a major company. We can get to that later. But she has all these things going. She has college plans, and I mean, Aunt May mentions um, college for Peter. That that's why she's going to nursing school. But can you really say like where Spider Man is in his life when you see this movie? See, I kind of took that as he is what's a good way to word that like uh he's not thinking about that stuff because he's having too much fun being spider-man and he's putting spider-man first before everything so it's not that like he um is he, he can't figure out a way to like get his life together and stuff he spent his whole life kind of just being the guy in the background and now he has the spotlight so he doesn't want to lose it and that's why i mean it's not necessarily like a good thing that that's the case but that's why he does come back at the end because he realizes that that is like the main thing in his life and even though spoiler alert i mean you're forgetting the spoilers this whole movie so if you haven't gotten it by now uh even though gwen dies eventually he is going to have to move on and it's better for him to be Spider-Man than just being mopey old Peter Parker again. Well, I will say in that last 10 minutes, they do a better job of making him a symbol of hope than DC did in Man of Steel for two hours. Fuck yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I died when they said that symbol of hope thing. I was like, no way did they just throw down the gauntlet and totally do it better. That's like everything with Marvel happens now and they just go, okay, remember that scene in Man of Steel where they fucked up and did it wrong? Let's do it right. <laughs> <laughs> like we have, we have to do something like a political message. Captain America, go do it, <laughs> do it right, and do it so well that everybody else will compare you to the Dark Knight. And uh, Spider Man, yeah, he's got blue and he's got red, and now he's better than Superman. <laughs> yeah. He's a symbol of hope that actually stops people from dying. Right. So the big thing that we're revolving around is the death of Gwen Stacy. Um, well, let's get that one out of the way, and we'll talk about the the end cap stuff afterward too not captain america the end cap like end scenes <laughs> <laughs> captain america pops up and everybody starts getting really happy that uh, there's an avengers crossover there's at least there's probably half a billion people who still don't understand why that can't happen yeah oh uh, there is we were talking about it after the movie uh i was saying it'd be funny if like they just threw some kind of a reference out there like uh they cast robert downey jr in like an x-men movie <laughs> and when he shows up on the screen he's got like the, st- the tony stark look and everything like that and people are like oh my god iron man's in there they're gonna do a crossover and then you just credit him as robert downey jr or he's like <laughs> phil williams or something like that and they're like look we cast robert downey jr we didn't cast tony stark what the fuck robert downey jr as himself right they pop up and they go hey good avengers movie <laughs> <laughs> but uh so with the uh the death of Gwen Stacy, instead of doing the typical storyline where Green Goblin, Norman Osborn, throws her off of the bridge and her neck either snaps from the web of Spider-Man or something else. And there's that whole, what happened? Is it, did Spider-Man cause it or not? Their interpretation this time is some kind of a giant clock. Does that actually have a name to it? Yeah, I don't. Last time I checked, Big Ben's not in New York City. It's right. still in London. <laughs> But yeah, they were just they're just a miscellaneous clock tower. The clock tower that overlooks the power plant. <laughs> that was kind of odd. <laughs> and it has some kind of a, a dogs. And has a giant fucking uh glass ceiling like you would have in like an arboretum or something like that. <laughs> but uh Harry Osborn, Green Goblin, is the one who tosses her down and instead of just snapping her neck, they make it a little bit more brutal by having her get caught just up above where that little um the extra couple of inches make all the difference and her neck bang smacks against the the bottom of the the floor whatever the ground is where all the pieces of the clock are all over the place uh how great was the web reaching out ah i loved that i actually forgot all the slow-mo but that 
the the movie really a lot of the fight scenes cut between the the quick action and real almost matrix slow motion so you can kind of I think it's kind of them showing off some of the intricacies of the real fluid combat, but he fires that web shot that makes it between four different cogs perfectly, and the, the ends of it reach out and just make a hand like web. It's just, it's perfect. That was I thought that that was one of the best parts of the whole thing, and something that they should incorporate into the comics or something. Not like you know every time he does does the spider web it turns into a hand, but like <laughs> the the symbolism of that of just you know it's the last thing that you could possibly do you you have your hand out it's a need to grab her kind of a thing and that was fucking beautiful i thought what did you think about that face oh i thought it was great uh i just remember as soon as they went on top of the bridge it kept leading to you and gerben going she's gonna die she's <laughs> gonna die and then it did it i was like that i actually sat there speechless when it happened because i knew it was coming but at the same time it was like oh they did that very well <laughs> yeah i made a joke uh <laughs> during the movie i said when he's uh they're standing up at the the golden gate bridge that he's like oh, i made a decision nope just pushes her <laughs> just kill her that way spider-man turns into an evil person by the end he stepped into venom when he was at the building <laughs> they, they end up merging that into uh superior spider-man turns out he, peter was all always just doc ock this whole time <laughs> As long as he does the strut that Tobey Maguire did in Spider-Man Three, <laughs> I mean, how totally do you without the strut. <laughs> now, I can't believe. I think it's gonna be an interesting weekend to see how people because you you just saw one of the biggest characters, one of the biggest fictional characters, let alone one of the biggest comic characters, fail, fail in the one moment where it really mattered. And this isn't Pepper Potts getting burned up, who has regenerative powers that also regrows her clothing. So that she can walk out of the flames and be fine. This is legit main character, main emotional support, main part of this guy's life gone. And she was at the tips of his fingers and he just couldn't pull it off. The only other film that's really done that has been The Dark Knight. Yeah, and that's even, but that still wasn't, I don't know. Like at that point, they were broken up though, you know? Like this was, this was like right, this was on like the eve of their their grand emotional journey, their, their big love affair. And true. I mean, there's, you can't really do a comparison of Gwen Stacy, who is this like brilliant, super attractive, funny, witty, amazing girl. And then there's Rachel Dawes, who doesn't look as good as she did in the first film and is kind of a bitch <laughs> and <laughs> is engaged to somebody else. Right. Spider Man 2 style. <laughs> but that really was the first time that they actually had the superhero flat out lose that battle. And. I think that this time it does have uh, more of an impact, especially because Gwen is Gwen Stacy instead of just Rachel Dawes, a character that could easily be killed off because she doesn't exist in the comics. Well, they spent all this time in this movie, too, showing you that he has nobody. His parents are gone. You know, like, you know, his 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 best friend who might have just gone back into town, but who he secretly all this time really cared about is gone. Like she, I, I never used the phrase his the like someone's rock because I think that's just ridiculous. But this whole movie really showed you like how much he needs her. Like I think they gave Green Goblin a really good motivation to get rid of her. What with the uh, the blood storyline? No, well, no. He said he made like this emotional point where he met her in the elevator, and she was talking about Peter, and she kind of said that he kind of extrapolated from what she was saying that she is. The thing that keeps people go, Peter going. This is after Peter Parker slash Spider Man essentially stole hope from Harry Osborne and said, "I won't try to help you beat this essentially terminal illness you have." And he realized, "Oh, Gwen Stacy is that person to Peter slash Spider Man. She's the reason he keeps on going. She's the reason he's able to get through all these hardships. I know he has in life. So that's why he decides to rob him of her, just like he's robbed Harry of his hope and his one chance at life." I actually liked even the concept. Well, you know, we'll we'll break down Green Goblin a little bit later. We'll, yeah. we'll keep on uh, Gwen Stacy for now. With um, with the death of Gwen Stacy, they were introducing a character uh, that they ended up cutting out, and that was Mary Jane. Uh, she was going to be played by Shaleen or Shaleel. I think it's Shaleen um, Woodley, and supposedly they cut her out because they said we have too many characters in this and we just wanted to streamline it and it didn't make any sense. I don't know. I get the impression that they, they cut her out half because of that half because they saw the backlash from the fans 
pretty much everybody was just like, she's not hot enough to be Mary Jane. And while, <laughs> while at the same time, 99% of the people that are writing that on the websites, you guys know, would totally just fawn over her if they saw her in person or whatever. And that, <laughs> there's that whole like, oh, she's a four out of 10. I wouldn't bang. Sure. Sure. Okay. Yeah, okay. Uh, but at the same time, I do kind of agree. I think that we went through the first Spider-Man series where we had Kristen Dunst, who's not an unattractive woman at all, but she just doesn't scream that super hot supermodel Mary Jane kind of thing. If they would have gone with that again, that would have been odd. Um, so I think that they half did it because they wanted to recast and half because of the, the streamlining stuff. But something about that uh, with the death of Gwen Stacy, I think if they would have introduced the Mary Jane character in here, it would have been an issue because it would have seemed like he moves on way too fast. Right. Like, I, I if there's they, be no hope when she dies. Right. If he would have met Mary Jane like, you know, midway through the movie and then at the end they – he she bumps into him again and it's like oh how you doing tiger and then he's just kind of like oh i can fuck that girl okay <laughs> like that would have been kind of bad well i thought it was interesting if we're on the women of spider-man that they brought i haven't checked the credits but is harry's assistant felicia hardy i that's think I, I think she is supposed to be felicia hardy that's what i presume from the name felicia that i thought it was it could be cool to see her if i mean her character they didn't really do anything with her to hint that she could be an an, an a top held star for any of these things but it'd just be nice to see them. i mean they had spencer Smythe in it as well so hopefully they're trying to expand the world a little bit well dace what do you think about the mary jane thing do you think it's a mistake that they didn't add her in here or is it a good thing what do you think about the casting who should play it if not her again i, I think it's a good thing they didn't bring her in like uh you, you had made point to they had a lot of characters in this and a lot of development they were trying to do with everybody and i think if we were in the theater and we got five minutes of mary jane we probably would walk away irritated, irritated and say, well, why the hell did they do that? I, I know they want to set up for the next one, but I think killing Gwen and leaving him alone sent a more of a powerful message than introducing Mary Jane real quick. And then you're screwed. What do you think about Shalene Woodley? Would she have been a decent choice or? Eh, it doesn't bother me either way. I could care less. Well, one thing I loved that they did in this was, after Gwen dies, they do the, the stereotypical funeral scene. It seems like every super, uh, Spider-Man movie has to have a funeral scene. <laughs> it's like hero <laughs> hospital scene. It's just, it has to happen. Uh, which is like, Jesus, who's going to die the next one? Um, but what I really liked about that was the passage of time. And that they showed that it wasn't just she dies and he grieves for like a week and then you get this kind of impression of like Oh man, like my life is over. But it'll be okay. I liked how it, this clearly has been bothering him for at the very least a year has gone by. I and, I'll, go ahead. And uh one thing I really liked too that um they didn't I don't think that they mentioned in the movie, but when I downloaded the or well, okay, when I bought the soundtrack, uh <laughs> the the song that they played um during that if i'm remembering correctly and if this is the right song and all that it's called let her go and i was like damn it that's good that's a good <laughs> pun to do that because the whole letting her go dropping her and letting her go physically and emotionally and mentally and all that perfect way to sum that up and um it's a weird situation to deal with when you have like a the love interest dies in something because if you make your hero move on, they kind of seem like an ass. But if they don't move on, then you just have this completely bitter, depressing person. And somebody like Spider-Man has gone through so much stuff over the years in the comics and TV shows and everything. But he's always still at his core been a positive hero. And if they would have made it too depressing, it would have gotten bad. And then you go the whole dark and gritty because we like the Dark Knight kind of thing. Um, so I like that they, they acknowledge the fact that it's not just, um, pushed aside, but at the same time you can get over it and not, ne not necessarily that you get over it and, you know, uh, the good line from Aunt May about it'll always be a part of you, but you'll, you'll find another place to put it in your life kind of a thing. I liked that a lot. I think that they could have handled that 
really poorly and they figured out a, a good compromise. What do you think, Tom? Um, I, I think the cool thing about that was the fact that, you know, I know we'll talk about it at some point. I know a lot of other people are talking about it. It's, you know, do we want to see Spider-Man in the Marvel Cinematic Universe at some point and all these things? I think that death montage and time lapse is a, is a strength it has by being its own independent franchise. They don't have to worry about keeping up with all the other movies or or building up to some other big movie. Because Spider Man, Spider Man himself is as big of a character as all the Avengers are together, in my opinion. So I think to let this one guy stand tall and, and kind of let all these things happen to this guy is is just as compelling as as having a Thor movie and a Cat movie all tie in together. So I like that we could stay with him for this whole. I think on, on, I think in the movie he said to her that it's been like five or six months. But the fact that you can have that passage of time and, and commit all that time to that character and the events of his life, I think it just makes it all feel like it has more value. Like all these all these events are weighted more and have more significance. Did you cut out there or did the... No, I, I just okay. I trailed <laughs> off with a strange inflection in my voice. <laughs> yeah, but I, I, th- I, I thought that part was very satisfying. But I think maybe that's why I thought transitioning then into like a mini fight scene was weird. Well, with the mini fight scene, I kept thinking to myself, I know that um, Paul Giamatti becomes Rhino in this, and we're running out of time here. Like, what's going yeah. on? I'm still not seeing Rhino. Did they, like, cut that out and show him? I was thinking when he was swinging to the power plant, I was like, it's nighttime, and all right. that footage of the Rhino's in the afternoon. Right. Like, like, don't tell me this is, like, day? a 14-hour marathon fight here. <laughs> Yeah, like it ends up, okay, you fought Electro, and he's done. Oh, crap, now Harry's the Green Goblin. Oh, okay, he's dead. Oh, crap, now there's a rhino. Then it's like, afterward, yeah. then it pops up, I'm the shocker. And he's just like, son of a bitch. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck, now I have to fight Big Wheel? Seriously? Yeah. Oh, no, there's the no hustler. And whoever Mr. Fear is. Uh, Mr. Fears. Yeah. Um. Uh, let's talk about that the little end cap stuff. Um, what I liked about that is if they would have ended with him just being depressed or if they would have just ended with him, um, doing some kind of a, I'm going to go out and be Spider-Man again and climb out the window and then everything's going to be better until the next movie thing. I wouldn't have felt as satisfied. And I think having that little thing in the end, it really speaks to one of my main things that I really liked about this movie, which it felt like a comic book and I don't mean that in a way where like Ang Lee was like, Oh, we're doing a comic book movie. So let's have comic book panels pop up (laughs) or when these people make things campy and silly and like Batman and Robin where they're like, Oh, well in the the comic books, there's fucking neon and shit. So let's make his Batmobile drive up a wall and uh, (laughs) all that. Like none of that crap. Like this felt like a comic book to me and it's structure uh, more so in like the ultimate series where I read, I think up until episode, uh, not episode, I'm calling it an episode, uh, until issue number 100 and maybe five or so, um, of the ultimate Spider-Man series. I didn't get into ultimate X-Men and a lot of the other ones. Um, but with the ultimate Spider-Man ones, I followed that, uh, maybe, After the first year or so, I um, started to get into it. And when I read that, I really liked how they kept things concise, but at the same time they did references to a lot of different things and they built upon stuff and they kept it where each story arc really felt like if it was a three-issue story arc or a five-one or a seven or whatever, you could tell that it was uh, in the middle of something else but you could read just that and it would be okay. And this one felt to me like they started it off and it's Spider-Man being Spider-Man. And it's just a a couple action stuff of him fighting this guy who ends up being Rhino. Just the same as if you had an issue now where he's fighting, say, Beetle. And Beetle doesn't matter that much into the story because after he fights Beetle, then it turns out that Electro is fighting something and then it's a, and it's an electro story or something i liked that uh it didn't really bother me because a lot of people go well if you have three villains then spider-man 3 proved that you can't have more than one villain that's not true 
Spider-Man 3 proved that if you don't want to have more than one villain, then you're going to fuck up. Because if Sam Raimi doesn't want Venom, he's not going to put any fucking effort into him. And if Sam Raimi wants Sandman to be the most important character in the world because he's got a boner for Sandman, then suddenly Sandman killed Peter Parker's parents. <laughs> but uh, with this, though, with the comic book feel, I I liked how it was bookended with Rhino stuff because Rhino is not a character that you need to build a story around or you really can build a story around. He's just a dude. Like you shouldn't build a story around him. No, you can't build any kind of a story other than an episode of a TV show where if you have a 20 minute window and you're a kid's TV show. Yeah. You can have this guy is the, the Rhino and he's, you know, r- running in the banks and stealing money. Okay. Well then you've got your TV show. Like, but you, you can't make a whole TV show out of that. So you can't do that with a movie and booking it with Rhino was a cool way of just showing off the universe. I think same with a lot of different cameos and we'll talk about all the cameos and all that. But, uh, I think doing that little last action set piece was true to that feel. You, you have these characters that are built around a central storyline, but the storyline is almost secondary in entertainment value to just watching Spider-Man do Spider-Man. Why did I say that phrase? I hate that phrase, that whole you do you and I do me. And what? <laughs> God, kill me. No, that's uh, true, though. The ending really made that feel like that was, as much as that was a big comeuppance for him to get back in the suit, it really made it really made it feel like that's just this is his daily life now. It's just taking on these challenges and which is something we haven't really seen much of Marvel outside Batrock the Leaper, who I think was another perfect use of that. Yes. C list villain shows up for a brief because a movie any movie is essentially a series of somewhere between like like six to ten challenges. And I think Bat Batrock I kinda like better. But I think between both of these, they found that Unlike Spider-Man 3, where they all need to have an intense story and come back and be part of the A story, this is a fun universe. Like, just throw, give me the shocker for one sequence for 10 minutes, and that's all we need. Right. Yeah, you can have him fight somebody like Shocker or Boomerang in the the um, the Ultimate Spider-Man video game. You fight Boomerang, and he's not a boss fight. He's, he's, just, just, he's just in this world. Yeah, he's just another dude that pops up, and you beat him up, and it's like, oh, that was Boomerang. Cool. Yeah, well, he was robbing a bank or something, and then that's why he fought him. Because that's what they do in the comics, and that's what I really liked. What did you think about the whole comic book field, Ace? Is that something that translated to you, or um, were you kind of annoyed with the the end cap and thought that that hurt the emotional value? Uh, When when it comes to the whole uh, ending scene, if they would have just ended it with Gwen's death and the whole plan coming together and not shown him return... I think it would have made a better, made for a better third movie coming up. Um, but I do like what you were saying with Boomerang. And again, it's another thing where Cap ruined it for the rest of the movies. <laughs> where um, the opening with Batra, the uh, Leaper, quick fight scene, kind of just like tipped their hat to another villain. And that was it. So Cap did it better. <laughs> it's, uh, it's a, well, that, and I, I think, I hate to say this, but there's, you know, it's 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 been interesting watching the superhero genre. As much as if you trace it back, superhero movies have been coming out since the twenties, but this wave of them has really evolved since the first uh, Spider-Man movie. So unfortunately, they've evolved cliches for themselves. That cliche of the little kid in the costume. Uh, oh, man. as soon as that scene started, I was like, oh, now we got to do this scene. Here we go. Did and anybody else get the feel that that was supposed to be a reference to Miles? They they just released a press statement yesterday saying, essentially, there's no way he's ever going to happen. Which is good, because he shouldn't. I mean, I don't even like the idea that Miles Morales happened, period. And that's not because it's like, oh, a non-white Spider-Man. No, it's a non-Peter Parker Spider-Man. Well, that's, you know, it's interesting <laughs> with this movie with this movie coming out, Spider-Man's returning to the 616 universe, which is the main Marvel universe. And if you've been living under a rock in the comic book Spider-Man lost a war for his brain and uh, Otto Octavius, Dr. Octopus has taken over his brain for the last just over a year. But actually something a lot of people forget is that in the late nineties, Marvel actually almost went bankrupt, which is when they sold the rights of the movie rights of X-Men to Fox and these Spider-Man movie rights to Sony. And Sony actually owns part of the publishing rights for Spider-Man. So mm-hmm. I wouldn't be surprised if Peter Parker is back in the ultimate comics as well within the next month or two. 
or if or if the seeds for him returning are sown. Because if you check out on Fanboys Anonymous, the review of Ultimate Spider-Man 200, we saw a silhouette that looked a lot like Peter at the end of the issue. So I wouldn't be surprised if he's due back any month now. Good, because I don't like a lot of that stuff. If you're doing like an Elseworlds kind of story or what if or whatever, that's a different thing. But there's, I don't know, to me, there's too much in comics where they try to replicate the same sort of thing for no no reason other than they want something different. Um, right. And I'm okay with different for some things. I actually like, especially when it comes to the, the race, race issue, I like Black Nick Fury better than White Nick Fury. Mm-hmm. And I would be more than happy if they figured out a way to reboot the current 616 universe and made Nick Fury look like Sam Jackson. That'd be they fine. Did that already. They did? But, yeah. it's, but it's not his, like... Uh, son who isn't really Nick Fury's like Nick Fury Jr. kind of thing. Oh well, yeah, they did that. Well, that's I mean, like just flat out, he is Nick Fury. Oh, he's a, they do he's it like that. Been, yeah, no, they didn't do that. That would be there'd be people pillaging things if they did that. <laughs> but like, I that means I don't like Miguel O'Hara and I don't like Ben Riley. I like my Batman to be Bruce Wayne. I like my Superman to be Kal El, and I like my Spider Man to be Peter Parker. I'm a simple man. Spider Man is Peter Parker, not one of these fake Spider Man, <laughs> not one of these different costumes. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't like when they add extra characters and do like Spider Boy and whatever. Well, like that means you're really excited for Spider Verse this November, featuring every Spider Man who's ever been created, right? Well, that that's a different story because they already made them, so do something with them. <laughs> but don't make and any more. just for pleasing you. <laughs> well, like, don't make any more. In fact, <laughs> when you do this storyline, kill them all off, except for Peter. And that's how you get rid of all that crap. Like, you can make a Ben Riley and a, a Kane and a doppelganger and all that kind of stuff, but write them all off at the end and go, that's because there's only one Spider-Man, it's Peter Parker. Fuck everybody else. And, what? like... Miles Morales, okay. If that's the only thing we ever see from a movie, a little reference of, I guess he was supposed to be like Miles Morales or something like that. that that's okay. He existed in the comics. You do a little reference. That's cool. Don't ever do a movie about it. At least it's not Will Smith, kid. <laughs> <laughs> but I would be just as annoyed if they made a Miles Morales movie of Spider-Man as if they did, um, if they would have made the Joyce, Joseph Gordon-Levitt version of robin if they would have made him batman in a movie he's not batman he is uh a what if version of robin so doesn't count like (laughs) (laughs) i just think it's a strange idea it's like very meta it's like look we're showing how much spider-man means to people in this world like isn't this whole movie supposed to be to make him mean something to us in the real world (laughs) like this is like us telling you that he means things to people well, I've, I've been here for two and a half hours. I already know that. I feel that. I just had to watch his girlfriend bleed through her nose because he failed to catch her. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, like, do we really need to see this little kid on this fucking costume and then hardened Paul Giamatti uh, Russian mobster with an un, with an accent thick as molasses in the thick of winter in the middle of Siberia, <laughs> like refuses to shoot at him, like. It's like, well, we just killed someone on screen. Just do something for the kid real quick. <laughs> like when I was a little kid, I never want like I didn't go to movies to see, oh look, there's a boy like me. I was like, oh look, there's Spider Man. That's who I want to be, not little kid fake Spider Man. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I know what you mean about that because I, whenever the the network execs are like, oh, we need to appeal to the kids and stuff. It's like, you have Spider Man done. Like, yeah, you win i fucking watched robocop as a kid because robocop was badass not because there was a little kid tagging around with robocop who was going like how you doing cop or something like that thanks <laughs> like, for the help little little boy. right yeah like i if i were uh reading comics back when they introduced robin i probably wouldn't have liked robin because it wouldn't have mattered to me that he's got a kid next to him it would have been like why is batman hanging around with a kid this is weird I, no, I I fucking love the the Dick uh, Grayson character, right? But I don't like how they do a lot of that stuff just for the sake of it. So adding the little kid in there, if they did it because they wanted a Miles reference, okay. If they did it because they thought that that was going to end up uh, showing off like to little kids that you should buy more merchandise, come on. 
It's just not the value. The 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 cops can't. New York City cops can't catch a six year old. He, oh darn! He got out of our grasp. Well, now he's out there in front of the death machine. <laughs> but they oh, can restrain oh. the mother. <laughs> right. They grab, the they, they grab her, and it's like, no, don't go out there. And then the one What's guy like, literally says, "Kid, you gotta get out of there." <laughs> like You're it's New like York's it's finest. one thing he goes it's one thing if he goes in front of Boomerang. That thing has two machine guns on its hands <laughs> and rocket launchers. It's pure death. <laughs> and they're doesn't... like, we're cops. We're sworn to protect the innocent. Except for that kid. I ain't gonna fucking hear that thing. <laughs> this were DC, that kid would have had six holes in him before Spider-Man got there. No, oh, I'll never give up being Spider-Man again. <laughs> now, if this was DC, that kid would have had the uh, holes in him, but it would have been because Spider-Man fucking did it. <laughs> Well, then they would have had a they would have had to figure out a way to make the title something without the character's name in it. <laughs> the amazing. They would have just been like web slinger. <laughs> yeah, wall crawler. Dude, he gets bit by spider. <laughs> the movie Spider Teen. <laughs> oh man! So I I was I guess you could call it lucky enough to see one of the last three performances of the not hit Broadway play Spider Man Turn Off the Dark. <laughs> And there was a point in that movie where Electra was like, I'm going to turn off all the lights in the city. I was like, no, no, no. That is too close to the title of that play. It's too easy for someone to say, now we got to turn off the dark. And everybody <laughs> just starts breaking out into dance. Yeah. Well, I'd start singing one of the memorable songs from that movie if there was one, or from the play. But... <laughs> Did you get injured when you were seeing it? <laughs> no, which means I didn't have an experience. <laughs> which is awful. So... Uh, any other thoughts about the end cap stuff before we move on to whatever different topic we move on to next? I think there's a bigger conversation to be had about sequel setup, so we'll save that for later. All right, action. Let's move just on to that one because that's a pretty easy transition. I think that this was the best example of Spider-Man action that we've ever gotten. Um, he really seemed more like Spider-Man in this one. He's agile. He's flexible. He... Um, it's doing a lot of moves that you would see in like a video game for it instead of just a couple punches and some obvious wire rigs like in the first movie, which credit to uh, Sam Raimi. When they did that first movie, they did a hell of a job for never having any kind of a reference point, knowing what is good and what doesn't work and all that. They right. pulled that out of their ass extremely well. So it's not that it's like okay, well, now enough time's passed, so fuck those guys. They didn't do a good job. No, they did, like, the equivalent of what Star Wars did, where Star Wars doesn't look as good anymore. But, back in the day, phenomenal. Yeah, so, it, was, it was a trail setter, trailblazer. Right, so credit to them for that, but at the same time, I think that this upped the ante, and this gave us the best action out of all the Spider-Man movies. Dace, what do you think? Uh, definitely. Uh, there were some points, though, where it was entirely too fast. Like, I'm old, I guess, and I can't keep up with the screen moving so fast anymore. <laughs> but he was flying through those freaking streets and spinning through the pillars and stuff like that. I'm like, holy shit. But like you said, it's exactly what a game would be like or actual Spider-Man fighting. Uh, I'm just old and can't keep with it. <laughs> You're sitting there like in your seat. Just no, I, gotta, I gotta calm down. What did he just do? <laughs> just, go, just go play chess in Central Park, goddammit. <laughs> Yeah, then it will show us that you still have your powers. Yeah. <laughs> um, I guess I'll pick up on the old man thread there. Um, I'm going to have to say I'm a little disappointed because I think I agree this was some of the best Spider-Man action, but that's because it was the least human in a Spider-Man costume during the action. And if there's anything The Matrix Reloaded taught me, it's that it doesn't matter how cool and choreographed a fight scene seems, 10 years from now it's going to look like crap. Because <laughs> if you go back and watch that Smith Neo fight, it's just it looks like Wallace and Gromit. <laughs> um, and I thought some of the moves were really, really cool, and I really enjoyed some of the intricacy. But I didn't love it constantly slowing down. Yeah, like to really because there was a point where it's like these action sequences aren't that long if you play them normal time, and the amount of stuff he's doing. Like, it isn't that interesting. Like, he just kept doing, like, essentially a plug and chug. Like, well, I'll jump over here. Nope, jump over here. Nope, jump over here. Nope, 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 nope. Real time, punches him. Okay, that worked. <laughs> um, and I also thought the slow motion, like, there was, a, there was that... I, so, I'm the blood red, angry red light in this, uh, this triumvirate conversation. And I didn't like the movie. But I really, like, the first ten minutes I thought were solid. And maybe that's why, for me, it was just a slow ascent from there. 
But like the opening scene, it's him being cocky and agile Spider-Man is like, wow, this is cool action. Okay, slow motion. Oh, wow, you can see all those cars crashing and blowing up. Wow, everyone who was in that car just died. Yeah. <laughs> all right, yeah. I guess we're cool with that. That's fine. Like that part where he, he saved that one from the cab. The cab flips over, front end crunches inside the ground. Ha ha, cocky aside. Someone just died in there. <laughs> I had the same kind of idea, though. Like, he was kind of blowing that off inside. Uh... Yeah, like that car, he's just like, as much as the literal, literal rhino guy who stole an armored car with a, with a, or a tow truck thing, he would just, like, every time he crashed somebody, people were dying. Or like the one time he, like, let him, he's like, he, he told uh, Gwen to hang on because he was going through an intersection. Hang on, something's in his way. Yeah, that something is small vehicles containing families. <laughs> <laughs> like,. <laughs> So, I mean, again, if we're talking about the the symbol of hope thing, he was certainly a better symbol of hope than than uh, Superman and Man of Steel, who who probably let about eight square city blocks just crumble. But uh, I don't know. To to me, it was good action. But I think movies like these that are popcorn movies, where you know you're gonna have some you're gonna have some plot hang ups. They're trying to do a lot. It's hard to do serious drama when you're trying to make it a family popcorn movie. I think the action has to balance it out, and for me, it just didn't quite get there. Dace, what did you think about the action stuff? Uh, Anything else that you hadn't touched upon before? No, I just, like, I'm old. Couldn't keep with it. <laughs> and like he said, ten years from now, we're going to look back like, huh, Electro looks like shit. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, I think some of that stuff, like, it looks like it was made to be video game levels. Like when he's mm-hmm. bouncing through the pylon, or those, like, energy tubes and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. I thought he got his ass kicked too. Like, like that part. Like he had like nothing going for him. No, <laughs> like, he had no way out of that. Gwen's really? the only one who got a good shot in, and then you know <laughs> she died. <laughs> oh yeah. Okay. We'll have to say the whole. I'm the only person who can turn off the power plant by using the large switch labeled emergency shut off <laughs> that the guy had a key to in his hand. Like he could have done it. Well, hand propped like, up. <laughs> hand propped up, just in case you were wondering. <laughs> oh my, like, ah! Because that's, it's like the setup. It's it's the little things. Well, you're the, I'm, Peter, I have to be here. I'm the only person who knows how to open the emergency shutoff button. Well, if you're the only person, I guess we have to then. <laughs> <laughs> well, special effects, let's move on to that. I thought that the special effects were great. I really don't have too much else to say about that. I mean, great special effects are great special effects. Uh, it's not going to win any awards, though. That's one yeah. thing for sure. You never really had any big bursts of it, you know? I mean, I guess you had that power station at the end, but it was a, there was a good half hour, 40 minutes of that movie that had no action. Yeah, about like um, maybe when, like halfway through or so. Yeah, we really focused on the Harry story when he really just became crazy. Like were, I mean, I guess there was, oh, well, I shouldn't say that. I guess there was like a little bit of like, you know, Harry murdering people, but I'm not talking, soup, not a lot of Spider-Man in the suit action. Right. But I think that even just having um, Jamie Foxx look like a being made out of electricity, they pulled that off. And I liked when he specifically transformed into the, um, the one, the wall outlet. Yeah. I thought that that was done well. Well, I think, if anything, this really needs, you know, we're really getting, as always, pop culture with technology stuff is changing. I think what this and Winter Soldier and hopefully a couple more of these movies need to really tell people is that you can't make any kind of judgments off set photos. Right. You, right. Ju- you just can't. I mean, he, he looked infinitely better than some of those set photos we saw. Yeah, where he I, just I, looked like a member of the Blue Man group. <laughs> yeah. Or uh, Tobias Bluth. <laughs> Sorry, Tobias Fune K. But, uh, yeah, I, th- I thought he looked good. I mean, he was, again, I, I think plot lines were tripping over each other because he was, once again, just a bastardization of uh, the bad guy from The Incredibles slash Guy Pierce from Iron Man 3, which is unusual bedfellows. But, yeah, I thought special effects were good. I thought the Goblin looked, you know, again, talking, you mentioned earlier about having having to make things different than they were before. Um, I thought the Goblin looked much more menacing this time around. A lot of his special effects and some of his the glider and stuff looked good. Damn sure looked better than Harry Osborn Goblin from Spider-Man 3. <laughs> Jesus <laughs> Christ. Strawberries. <laughs> I, I love that gif. House Whenever of I Pie. The people, that's what I send the people. The House of Pie thing. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> House of Pie. So good. So Wink. good. <laughs> but, that is yeah. literally the best part of that fucking movie, which is that. Which, I mean, I guess, I mean, do you want to get into the Green Goblin? 
Well, basically, in, in general, Dace, what do you think about the special effects? Then we'll hop on the Green Goblin. Sure, in general. sure. Uh, really good. Um, the whole it, it was difficult, probably taking on an Electro type character and doing it the way they did, and I think they did pretty well. Well, actually, they did phenomenal, not pretty well. Maybe um, another couple seconds. You like the movie more? <laughs> it was okay. Oh, actually, it was fantastic. We're getting there, but you're gonna find there's gonna be one part where it just kind of like tanks again. So up and down, <laughs> up and down. Yeah. All right. Character wise, Green Goblin. I thought Harry Osborn was both better and worse than the last Harry Osborn that we saw in different ways. Um, he was a little bit too much of a dick. Where I didn't get the impression that he and Peter would have actually been friends. I sort of, if they would have kept more of the first scene that they had together, or the second scene that they had together with uh, skipping the rocks and stuff, then that could have made more sense. But um, overall, he seemed more like just a casual acquaintance kind of a thing. Um, So that wasn't as good. But at the same time, I think that the good thing that they did with Harry this time was they gave him a stronger motivation to be a villain than just you killed my father and I'm going to assume that you killed my father and all that. Like he had an actual personal stake in this other than revenge. And I don't know. My, my favorite version of Harry Osborn is, I guess you could say a combination of the two. I like Harry being a kind of charming guy who is a bit of an ass, but he at his core is a good person. And I didn't like how this ended with him not being a good person. But then again, there, that's the potential in the future for that to get changed. I like how in the third Spider-Man movie, he becomes a better one and, you know, he dies heroically and all that. But I do like when he's got more of that edge and he, he seems like that spoiled brat of a kid like there's one specific line in this movie that I liked a lot from Harry Osborn where he was just like, uh, you know, like I've dated supermodels. It gets so old, doesn't it? Like just <laughs> you prick you. Like, <laughs> I thought what always kept him realistic was that he was kind of like that cool kid that knew he related to you, but in public wouldn't necessarily go out of his way to like be next to you or help you or help anyone else know that you're a decent person. Yeah. He, he had that rich entitlement. Um, I need you to be my friend because I need something real in my life. But if it comes down to it, I can't be seen with you kind of a thing that I liked. I, I just didn't. I think the number one decision I didn't like was having him try to do a Chris Cooper accent, which is the guy who played Norman Osborn. Like he kind of tried to me. I could tell he was really trying to impersonate him to make it sound like they were. But when we know he was raised in New York city, so I don't I, – I have to stop – because I think – what's his name? Dale Hanan. I'm not sure how you say his name. Dane Hanan. Dane I, Dehan. Yeah, I think he's a great actor. Like I was really – like I think he kind of got the goblin laugh. Like I thought he was a very menacing villain at the end. I just think character work-wise, he didn't get a lot of room to do a lot. You know what does suck about Dane? Mm. His two main roles now that have been in movies have been in Chronicle and in this. And in both ones, he plays somebody's friend – who ends up being a bad person, loses his shit, gets superpowers, flies around, and then gets his ass handed to him. Wait, does that also happen in the Metallica movie he was in? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> that doesn't count. Maybe. That'd be funny as hell if it did, though. <laughs> like, you get specific typecasts, like Al Pacino, he's always angry. Robert De Niro, he's like a mobster guy. Uh, well, Farrell, he's always playing like the stupid, dim-witted type of guy and all that. And it's like Dane DeHaan. Okay, here's the part where you get your superpowers. Here's where you fly around. Here's where you die. It's just like, fuck, this is a comedy. Like, I'm I'm in the middle of like a re. Uh, they showed the um the previews for a, a new Annie movie. It's like he gets cast in that. And they're like, yeah, they fly yeah. around and do the same shit. He's like, fuck, <laughs> that's not in the source material. Well, Kill all the orphans. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you know what's like another trope I'm really getting sick of in the comic book thing is like the the disenfranchised billionaire thing. Damn you, board members! I'll show you to disrespect me. Like, can we just either let someone be a billionaire or just like find something? Like, they have to have hobbies. There must be <laughs> somewhere else he can go do bad things. Like an arrow, they do it all the time. 
Iron Man, they tried to do the whole board takeover thing. Like I, Batman, they did the whole board takeover thing like twice. The original Spider Man too. Oh yeah, they oh, gosh. they I bumped just... out Norman. <laughs> <laughs> it's like no repercussions can come out of this. What the hell's that orange uh, thing <laughs> flying at us? <laughs> I think it's like the first thing to do. Okay, well let's start the script tomorrow. Well, well. Oh, we'll just try to get the ball rolling. Well, okay. Um, so we know at some point he's going to be kicked out of his company. So let's go ahead and write down right now. You can't kick me out. I started this company. <laughs> there we go. All right. Now we need a character that is not necessarily from the comics who can tell the person that they're getting kicked out because they're taking it over. And then they can die because we want to see them die. <laughs> so so we've got Colm Fior here. He could be a perfect vulture. We're going to cast him as Donald Mencken, where the fuck that is. <laughs> I really, I literally went into this movie thinking that he was going to be Vulture. Yeah. And I accidentally looked on IMDb um, a couple hours before oh, going to the movie. Like... And I was like, looking through and it's like, oh, okay, well, it's, you know, Sally Field, Aunt May, and uh, et cetera, et cetera. And then I see no Adrian Toomes. And I'm like, Wait a minute. Well, then who the fuck is Colin Fury? Donald Mencken? <laughs> I don't fucking remember this name. <laughs> like, is this like some off-world vulture the other character? Like, they had... <laughs> I know they had, like, the old man vulture, and they had the young man who can steal people's life force or some shit from, like, the animated series, but... Uh, I don't remember them being Adrian Donald Adrian. Mencken. They cast what? They cast Adrian Toomes already. Who is it? I forget. It, I mean, uh, honestly, I can't even. Okay, I write for a geek culture website, and I can't even keep up with all this casting news. Well, if it was a fan cast, you know who it would be? Patrick Stewart. Yeah, he's a bald guy. He's in every <laughs> bald role. Patrick Stewart should be uh, the next Mr. Freeze, too, while we're at it. Yeah. Ian McClellan could be Scorpion. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I have to go through every. Like, I'm looking at pictures and stuff to try to remember everything about this movie. I just thought the green. Well, then I think the way that Spider Man beat Green Goblin with one kick, like two minutes after he showed up, like he was really just there to kill Gwen and then be in the next movie. Yeah, Which, I don't know what they're going to do in the next movie with him either. Yeah, because I don't know. Well, because there's all these rumors about the Sinister Six being a standalone movie. However, that works. I have no idea. Um, so I, I really. Uh, but I, I, I'm not sure they know where they're going at this point. Oh, we'll, we'll definitely have to touch on Sinister Six because that idea just seems so boneheaded to me. Um, yeah. what, did you, what did you think about Green Goblin and all this uh, days? I liked Harry and I liked his casting. And I liked that they did a spin on uh, the Goblin by having Harry just take the mantle rather than do the whole Norman thing. But I'm really pissed that they wasted Chris Cooper and Norman Osborn in like five minutes because <laughs> it's Chris Cooper. Like he's the ultimate bad guy and he would have been a great Norman Osborn. And it was just like, mm, he's dead. <laughs> he's gone now. Well, you never know. I was like, I was really ready to leave at that point. I'm like, oh, what the fuck? I was like, I know Harry's going to take it, but maybe Harry dies for whatever reason. And then Norman actually becomes that badass green goblin that we all want. But you know, they body jump. Yeah, just something times two. <laughs> I just I was Chris Cooper. I th- this is why it makes the movie mix because there was good points and then there was you killed Chris Cooper. Fuckers. I don't think that they did. I think he's coming back the next one. I don't know. I mean, I haven't heard of anything that says that he's cast in it. And then of course they could always just say, yeah, he was cast in it, but he's in a flashback. Where like what they did with Dennis Leary, where he shows up in the middle of nowhere because he's a hallucination from uh, something or other, but like um, I, I could see Norman Osborn coming back still. I just be... Go ahead, Dave. Oh, that, that would just be like sad because Norman Osborn is such a huge villain in the comics for like everybody and you're trying to create this universe and you kill him like instantly. Oh, God. Piss me off. I just can't see that. Maybe it's because I think of that guy as like such a badass. I see them coming up to him with, like, like, here's your costume. Get that the fuck away from me. <laughs> <laughs> my costume's like je- like a, a pair of Levi jeans and 
Just some bloody knuckles. <laughs> <laughs> like, I just don't see that guy strapping up and like, here's the green and purple, Mr. God. Oh, and here's a satchel full of pumpkins. Get your satchel away from me. <laughs> I just burn people with Marlboro Reds. <laughs> we could have an American Beauty reunion. It could be, uh, he could be the villain. Uh, and then we can have oh, Kevin Spacey Luther. could be uh, Vulture. <laughs> <laughs> What's her name? Mina Savari. She could be like, um, the hell's any of the... Uh, Oh, that one, that one woman. Um, Just the girl Spider-Man villain, Madam Web. <laughs> oh God, that would be even worse. <laughs> I wasn't thinking <laughs> of that. Uh, if you're gonna do Madam Web, Helen Mirren. <laughs> you gotta go with Helen Mirren. There, there's, I don't know when. It, I think I saw one of my parents like cassette tape covers right when I was in the Amazing Spider-Man cartoon. But ever since, I've had an unyielding dream that Sir Elton John would play Doctor Octopus. <laughs> <laughs> He's got like, that square head with like the orange bowl cut. He wears the round glasses. He's got nothing else to do. I'd be in for that. <laughs> you know who I'd like to see play the part? We're getting into like fan casting territory here. Or maybe we'll do that eventually. Uh, another fanboys cast. Um, I can't remember his name, but he was in the second Sherlock Holmes movie. Oh, he's also in Resident Evil. I know you're talking about Mark Strong. No, um, he played Moriarty in the second one. That's not Mark Strong? No, he was the villain of the first one. Blackthorn or something like that. Oh, that's Um, right. I want to say his name starts with an R, which means it's probably there is no R in his name, period. (laughs) Because I'm usually wrong with that kind of stuff. Um, (laughs) But uh, he's somebody who I thought could have been a good... Jared Harris. Hey, there's an R. There's three. Jared Harris, there you go. Perfect. Otherwise known as like Richard or whatever the hell else. Like. <laughs> Ray. <laughs> yeah, he could be a good uh, Doc Ock, I think. But I don't even really want to see Doc Ock. I mean, I want this next movie to, well, you know, I'm looking at that a little bit later. But uh, yeah. Um, Green Goblin, though, any other thoughts that everybody has to throw out there for Green Goblin before we do, go to a different character? I'll, I'll just say I'll take I'll take Tobey Maguire pulling a fake brick wall over somebody in a Power Ranger suit any day. <laughs> Willem Dafoe. <laughs> <laughs> been forcing Aunt May to do the Lord's Prayer. Come on, that's classic filmmaking. Finish it. Deliver us. <laughs> we go back and watch that tonight. <laughs> just it's so bizarre. Like in retrospect, that is such a weird thing to do. <laughs> Finish it. It really is awkward. Uh, here's a thing that I had a problem with. We're going to bounce from big character to small character. Felicia. Don't even bother. She's not Felicia Hardy. They should have just named her something else. Or they. And I love cameos in movies. I loved when they had Victor Zaz as a, a villain in the first Batman Begins. Yeah. I love when they throw fucking references out to, to Doc Ock and to Vulture and, uh, you know, if they would have had. Uh, like the first Spider Man movie with Sam Raimi. Who does he kill first when he becomes Green Goblin? Mendel Strom. Perfect. You can kill off Mendelstrom and it's not going to make a difference. You're not going to have him actually start working with fucking Stegosaurus man shit and stuff. So <laughs> you can do that. But Felicia is not a character that you should do that with. I think that they missed their opportunity to not only diversify the cast a little bit more and have Lily Hollister be that part, but Lily makes more sense to me to be the person who's aiding Harry than Felicia because at least she has a connection with Harry when it comes to like romantic relationship and stuff so that annoyed me uh it was cool going like oh Felicia's Hardy Felicia Hardy's in this maybe they're setting up Black Cat and then it's like nope Nope. (laughs) she's not gonna do a damn thing in regards to Black Cat whatsoever I mean they probably would have even been better off making her Betty Brant or something they still haven't updated IMDB to call her um, Felicia Hardy yet. It still just says Felicia. Oh, that'd be even worse if they added a character named Felicia who looks like that, and then they turn out that that's not Felicia Hardy. <laughs> yeah, that's not her at all. That would just be really ridiculous. Uh, that British desk attendant. <laughs> so, Felicia Hardy, Dace, what do you think about her? Meh, I didn't even make the connection because it's just, it didn't, it's like, oh, it's, his secretary's name is Felicia. I, I immediately thought of Arrow and Felicity. 
We were distracted like, by that gap in her teeth. So it, it just caught me off guard. Like, who's that chick? That's cool. That's fine. Where's J.K. Simmons? I need a uh, Jonah we'll, Jameson. We'll do him next. Uh, <laughs> Tom Felicia. Yeah, same same thing. I think again to get because to me, someone who really loves Sp- the first two Sam Raimi Spider Man movies. To justify this trilogy, take me to new places. What haven't we seen yet? All right, Sinister Six, sure, why not? Let's go crazy. Rhino, okay, there's a part of me who was really happy to see Rhino. Like, give us some Black Cat then. Give me, give, put something in your, put some stuff in your wheelhouse. But yeah, I, I thought that was just a wasted opportunity. Or even do something like she steals something from Oscorp. And that's why you don't see her anymore for the rest of the film. But there weren't even, there weren't even enough clips to, to find a way to like to find a sneaky way to go in the next movie to be like, Oh, well here's what she was doing there the whole time. Like she didn't have like some tablet where she could have been stealing information or something black or uh, Catwoman style or anything like that. She was just, she was just an accessory, which I mean, people are gonna be mad enough that they did the whole kill a female character just to progress the male character story already. So that's a whole, that's just another female character that we're just, eh, whatever you're just there. That's Bye. fine. Actually, before we do J.K. Simmons, I'll throw another one out there. A- Dr. Ashley Kafka. Not a woman in this. Was that the... Uh... That was a overly German Dr. Kafka who spoke like fucking Dr. Kaufman from Tomorrow Never Dies. <laughs> that was kind of stupid. To me, that was their way of uh, avoiding killing a woman in here to go with um, the Gwen Stacy one. They didn't want to kill two women in it. And it's like, you know what? If you were going to make that character villainous and have to kill the character off, why couldn't you make it a woman, too? Women can be villains, too. I just couldn't get... To me, it just seemed like watered-down Zola. Yeah. Poofy kind of orange hair, almost giddy with excitement at torturing someone for scientific discovery. Uh, to, to, me, that's where it, to me, that's where it feels like people stop getting these movies anymore. Like That felt like, a character, that felt like it should have been a character from 60s Batman. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I could see that. <laughs> It's just that kind of that silly melodramatic. Yes, yeah, so let's see what mysteries I can unlock from your body. It's like it just, but that was German and Bane at the same time. I don't know. I'm really, <laughs> I'm really upset about this. But that that was just to me that was on par with, if not worse than. No, I take that back. I'll never say anything is worse than a little boy running out in front of uh, in front of Rhino. But it's just it's another one of those eye roll scenes. It's just it's just like um, when they cut to those two nerdy guys because they're nerdy smart guys because they have glasses and they know things about stuff on a newscast <laughs> like having characters like those two guys and like ridiculous this is why people don't take these movies seriously like can we can we just be done with this now well that moves on to the, the J. Jonah Jameson thing that was I mean they, they couldn't find the time to introduce the character in here and it seems like they just aren't going to. I don't think we're going to be having that pop up in the next one. And maybe that's better that way. I don't know. I mean, he needs a fresh start after this. So I could see him. I mean, they kind of, they've planted photography enough times. His dad, they made a point of showing that camera. His dad took the family picture with, he's got these pictures all over his room along with his records. Cause now he's punk rock, Peter Parker, who wears jean cutoffs and a punk band shirt to his graduation. <laughs> <laughs> but, they need something for him to go to because, I mean, he's kind of like Bruce Wayne. There's like three different kinds of Peter Parkers. There's photography Peter Parker, teacher Peter Parker, and science Peter Parker. And he's obviously not science Peter Parker since he had to get his girlfriend killed to activate the emergency shutoff switch. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm guessing he's going to be photography Peter Parker. So I'd like to see them build to something. I just don't know why in a movie that was so busy, why do you waste screen time? introducing something here what with the photography stuff yeah I, I don't know if they did, yeah i don't know if they needed that for to have a way for um harry to know they're in cahoot well him and spider-man are in some kind of yes all right i'll just say in cahoots <laughs> like i don't know if they if they needed that for a vehicle to me that just like that was a good five minutes that we could like he could have had one more bromance date with harry to make it kind of sad when his friend betrays him i think that it kind of solved a couple different things it not only was fan service to get the people to be like hey jay J- jonah jameson sent that email with the wrong thing <laughs> everybody laughed in the theater when we saw that uh 
fan service in that regard, another way of building the universe to be like, oh, there's stuff that happens outside of this. He's got a job, and it's not the most important thing for the story, but it, hey, he is still Spider-Man doing the same Spider-Man shtick. Um, Spider-Man can. Right. Uh, but at the same time, it, it did serve a purpose with you take pictures of him and all that, which when that happened, I had two things that popped in my mind. The first thing was, yeah, that's a good way for uh, Harry to understand that and everything. And then I was like, but wait a minute. Out of all the times that he must have that happen in the comics and everything, because obviously the comics don't take place over the course of 50 years like they actually do in uh, real life. But to think like that in the comics, Peter Parker, as far as I know, has never gotten to the realization of like, fuck this really ties me to Spider-Man. <laughs> like, oh, uh, I can't be with you and date you because if they know that you're, that I'm Peter Parker, they'll go after you. All right. Well, the only way they'll, they'll know that Spider-Man has any kind of connection with Peter Parker is if you don't stop taking fucking pictures of Spider-Man. Like, you know what you just did? You just found a way to prove that P- that Peter Parker cares more about money than his girlfriend's safety. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to find out I'm Spider-Man because I'm taking these pictures and I'm not going to stop taking these pictures. Well, it's different if he's doing something else with the Daily Planet, a uh, Daily Planet, a uh, Daily Bugle. <laughs> there you go. We're going to Superman territory again. Um, you know, if, I think it was in the, the Ultimate series. He was just doing some of the um, the website stuff, which is like, yeah. ah, web design. I get it. You know, but um, <laughs> that line get cut from the movie. I think so. Yeah, it did. It's like the uh, Scarlett Johansson Iron Man scene. <laughs> it got cut at the same time as Venom did. <laughs> it's but, just on the cutting room floor getting stomped on <laughs> but the uh, I think he did the website design stuff on that which is like okay you're not as much of a connection to Spider-Man there so that makes sense but you, you'd think after a while people were just like hey not many people know who Spider-Man is but clearly Peter fucking Parker does he's just a poor kid from the Bronx with a really long lens a super <laughs> fucking long lens who just happens to be there all the time like once a week I think Peter's lens man. <laughs> They'll do it. He was already dusk at some point. Oh, he was all kind of ricochet. He was everybody. <laughs> so that bothered you that there was no J. Jonah Jameson in those days? Absolutely. Uh, although if they would have introduced somebody else besides uh, Simmons playing him, I, I would have been really disappointed. So I'm glad they handled it with an email without ruining jo- uh, Jameson for me. I think it's <laughs> I think uh, he wants to recast him to recast the Joker. He was just so perfect. Yeah. I think I'm you gonna... could actually have a better chance at recasting the Joker. Yeah, I agree. That's what I was saying. I totally agree. Because there's a lot of different interpretations of Joker that he didn't really necessarily hit on. Right. But J. Jonah Jameson is what J.K. Simmons did, and that's fucking it. Like, mm-hmm. I mean, you can maybe get some people to look like him because that's not really what he looks like necessarily either. But I don't know who could like have that voice for it and that um, snappy uh, delivery and everything. I really, whenever I've tried to do like a fan cast kind of thing, I can't think of shit for when it comes to that. <laughs> I could think of 10 different Peter Parkers. I could think of 20 different people that could play like Norman Osborn. You could get Jason Isaacs to play that part. Uh, and he could do just as good, if not better, than a Chris Cooper. But J. Jonah Jameson? Nothing. Squat. He owns that part. It's like Michael Jordan. Just retire the part. There's <laughs> no more J. Jonah Jamesons now because he ruined it. No more 23. <laughs> it can only be played by emails. <laughs> <laughs> if he's, He was so good. If I was a billionaire, I would hire him to be in character and like teach a high school class. <laughs> in character for six hours. Just berate people. <laughs> Scrap. <laughs> it's back to the I was trying to think if there's anything else weird with the photography and stuff like that. Mm, not really. They, they they really they really kept that tight though. They kept that small. I don't think they wanted to add too much into it just because then people would start asking more questions. It was already two and a half hours, which is considerable for one of these movies. I don't. I think Thor was like ninety minutes. Something like that. It was ridiculous. It needs to be two hours and fifteen minutes or up. I think for every one of these. Yeah, I, I I think if you want to really make because when you look at these things like a significant chapter in this big person's life, I think you need to have a lot happen. But and and fuck, when I'm paying eleven dollars a movie, right? I want to I want the son to be in a significantly different position when I come out than when I went in. <laughs> <laughs> 
that's why I'll give credit to Lord of the Rings. I'm not the biggest fan of those movies, but at the same time, when you go to see a Lord of the Rings movie, you know you get your money's worth because it's like four fucking hours long, and then <laughs> when you buy the DVD, <laughs> there's going to be 12 more hours added to it. And yet you're still pissed wanting more after it ends. <laughs> Except not more endings because Jesus yeah. <laughs> But, uh, all right, J. Jonah Jameson, we knocked him out. Uh, let's go to another big one, Electro. Electro is a, a, an odd character. You can't make a film out of him just the same as you can't do it with Rhino, which we pretty much talked about Rhino. I don't think there's anything else we need to do with him either. Um, but with those kind of characters, they needed to be supplemental. You couldn't have them be a driving force behind a movie. And I haven't read the script for, uh, what was his name? Um, James Cameron. For his Spider-Man movie, which was supposed to be... Oh, it's a treat. I think Electro and... Doc Ock. Doc Ock was the other one? Yeah, if you haven't read that thing, it's very easy to find on Google. It's amazing. Amazingly awful? Oh my god. If you want to talk about people not understanding what superheroes are about, this this could have been worse than Green Lantern. Really? Oh yeah. Could it it's have been awesome. worse than like Catwoman or Electra? It might no, it might have had worse costumes than Catwoman. It was pretty rough. It was just, I mean, I think it's more offensive because no one's really too upset if you mess up Electra. But to just totally botch Spider Man like that was like embarrassing. What was so off about it? He was like an asshole. He used to, like he used his powers to like like crawl windows and watch girls undress. <laughs> Well, now in this movie, he just stalks at least yeah, his it girlfriend. Was like, it's like so. Spider-Man meets Animal House. <laughs> I, to be fair, I'd watch that movie. <laughs> it was just like a total, like, this isn't Spider-Man. Like, but that's the thing. It's, okay, that's how Spider-Man would be if he was a regular person, but that's not how Peter Parker would be. Right. And that's, that's, a, that's, why, he's one of the, that's why he's one of the leading people, because outside of the suit, he's still an interesting character. I love the X-Man Warpath. He has cool daggers, and he kicks people's ass. Do I care about James Proudstar? Not really. <laughs> Not too interested. <laughs> well, but, but yeah, it's, it's easy to find online. So if anybody out there hasn't read James Cameron's Spider-Man script, sit cozy up by the fireplace with a warm bottle of brandy and enjoy. <laughs> with Electro, like you said, Electro is a character you can have a lot of leeway with, and it doesn't matter if you don't follow everything to a T. You can still get away with it. I mean, we didn't have... Electro with uh, the starfish looking face and the green outfit and hey, he wasn't even white in this one. It was like uh, a total ultimates. Let's just do what we want to do for this movie kind of a thing. And I think that that's probably my favorite interpretation of Electro that we've seen so far. Um, Cause he's not that intricate of a character. He's just dude with electrical powers and nope. that's it. Like I think he had a very clear objective that was understandable. That was sympathetic Mm -hmm. Um, and I think, you know, I'm going to try not to compare to the new gold standard of Winter Soldier, but like in Winter Soldier, everybody in that movie complimented the main theme, or like found a way to be a part of the main character storyline. And at least they found a way to kind of tie Electro into things that he wasn't just like this guy with powers doing stuff that Spider-Man came in and out of his life. And we saw what Spider-Man meant to him and we saw his delusion and all that. I thought he had a nice condensed character arc. I like that, and it's something that they can't do again with anybody else, right. even though it could have applied to some other people. I mean, you could have done, uh, say, I don't even know. Um, I mean, it, it was a pretty plug-and-chug character thing. Yeah. There's someone who idolizes the hero, the hero doesn't do what they want them to do, and they become the villain. Yeah, it, it could have applied to different villains that they've had other than the ones that have more driving force behind them. You can't do that with Venom, you can't do that with Carnage, but you pull out a different character, and that could apply. So it works with Electro. And uh, I think um, the the idea that they had of him being like a fanboy, maybe one more scene or one more difficult thing during the Times Square part would have helped it a little bit better. He did transition to being a villain a little fast, but at the same time, they did build it up a little bit with him having spent an entire life where everybody's fucking ignoring him. Um, there is a line that they cut or a scene or something like that that I I vaguely remember hearing about, but 
I don't maybe this is something that I actually just had in a dream or something like that or daydream <laughs> or whatever, but I thought that there was something that they had did where they mentioned that even his mom forgot his birthday. <laughs> and I didn't hear about that, but that 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 would be a good kicker. So yeah, because he had the whole thing with his birthday going on. I think maybe Jamie Fox said it during like an interview a year ago or something like that, where he said like, "Oh, uh, you know, even his mom doesn't remember his birthday." Um, maybe it was just hyperbole. I don't know. Yeah, one of those, one of those kind of actors read of a character, right? But yeah. if you're dealing with a life like that, of course, when people start shooting at you and stuff, you're going to be like, you know what? Fuck all this. <laughs> I'm a god now. The hell with your asses. Uh, <laughs> Dace, what did you think about Electro? Cool? I thought it was really cool. Uh, I mean, they did the character well. Jimmy Fox did great. There was brief moments, though, before he became the badass that it reminded me of that movie he did with Robert Downey Jr., the soloist. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, okay, well, he's just tapping into the well on that one. But it, it was... I thought he did great. I thought it was a great character build, but not stealing all this the uh, scene time from Gwen and Peter. The Electroist. Yule. <laughs> With Iron Man. <laughs> that would have been good crossover. My favorite was my mom leaned over and goes, wait, has Electro always had electric powers? <laughs> what else would he have? Like in the comics or in that universe? Well, she just because she grew up, you know, gave me the toys and stuff like that. So I think that was her way of like trying to figure out like which guy this was. There was like metal arms and there was like missile fist. <laughs> <laughs> There was green flying guy. Yeah, I was like, you wouldn't recognize him. Green guy with tail. Yeah, green tail, yeah. yeah big fat white man. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, why does my son want this character? <laughs> the thing, you know what really struck me about Electro, though? The the him falling into the pit of eels just, yeah, it treaded a little too close to Schumacher territory for me. With the it, eel looking at the camera. No, I just it kind of reminded me of like poison ivy falling into the pit of like miscellaneous growth. <laughs> I don't know. I guess like falling into the vat. I think like the scientific accident thing is again like it's just you're getting to the point where um, I think another conversation I have is Spider Man fatigue. It's been twelve years of this stuff. Like mutated animal happenstance. Like put a lid on it already. Like, make these things out of plastic. It's like those Resident Evil movies when there's always that slow-mo scene where they drop the vial of like unbelievably dangerous cancer stuff. If you put it in Tupperware, there's no movie. <laughs> <laughs> That's what they should do one time. It's like, whoops, we dropped it. Good thing that it's not in the glass case. Sorry, right, what do you want to do for the next two hours? Yeah, I don't know, yeah, get some bagels. It's the best ad for Glad Tupperware you'll ever see. <laughs> wow, good thing it's Glad Strong. Everyone would have started eating each other. <laughs> What else did you think about Electro? Uh, do you think that that was a good serviceable B villain? Since technically Rhino's the C villain in this. <laughs> yeah, I thought he was a good B villain. I think he was powerful enough that you need to have that that real danger to Peter Parker, which I think we really got to feel. Um, I mean, this is where I kind of missed that science Peter Parker, because I liked when he has to try to figure out a way to get it. Because I think there was that great part where he's suspended in the air, being electrocuted in the chest constantly and not dying somehow. Where it's like, wow, he's even though he has super strength and spider sense and webs, like he's he's not a god, you know, he's not Superman, he's not Green Lantern. I mean, he's not even Batman. Like you could see that he could. Uh, Electro was a good villain to really put him in danger. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know. I was just a little disappointed with that. the The transition from Electro to Green Goblin was just a little weird to me. Well, yeah. in the action scene that it's... Yeah, it, it, all his stuff just kind of, like, ended. Like, all his scenes just kind of, like, fizzled out. I never liked the, the, the plot angle that it's, like, and then he gets really hit hard. Bang. Now he's now he's finished. Now you got him. It kind of felt like a transition from, like, a mini-boss into the real boss is coming when they went yeah, from Yeah, it's like, when you think you to... beat the last boss, it's like, oh, a challenger approaches. What? I thought I just beat the boss. <laughs> right. Yeah, I beat Magneto. It turns out she's actually just Mystique. <laughs> <laughs> Shit pisses me off yeah, every really. time. Um, Welcome to die. <laughs> I was really distracted by his first manifestation scene because I liked... Oh, that's what I wanted to say with the Jameson thing. I like that scene of Spider-Man getting to talk down Electro, which was weird because this is the first Spider-Man movie we've seen where the general public slash the police like slash respect Spider-Man, mm-hmm. which made for a much different kind of tone. 
but I could not get past the music. I thought his theme was really weird. And anyone in Hollywood who might be listening to this, I know the theme for a character named Electro being electronic music probably sounds really clever, but come on. <laughs> like, you, what you, are the lyrics of that song? Ah, Spider Man betrayed me. Don't be. It's like really weird. That it's was, like it's paranoia, something, something. It's just like, I well, don't know these lyrics to this song, and now I'm singing <laughs> it over and over again. And I'm like, I, I really don't get it at all, but. Well, and then before that, though, his original character theme is like that, like clarinet music. Like it's like weird elevator music. <laughs> like, so that's why there's that scene where we're panning around Times Square and everyone's frozen quiet. And we don't know what Electro's going to do. He doesn't know what he's going to do. He doesn't know what he can do. He's lost. He's confused. There's guns drawn. <laughs> like, I'm like, there's just no tone here. Like I, I was, you know what I tried to do at one point? I tried to like plug my ears and be like, "What did this look like before they added the oboes?" <laughs> <laughs> and it's the how I felt because for me that just took me out of it. And then, and the, the end fight scene. But again, I think this is where you get into it's where I missed that gritty. Like when you watch Spider Man fight Green Goblin, and this is what thirteen years later, they're punching each other through buildings, they're hitting each other with glass, their costumes are torn. Like you know, they're really having a scrap. Whereas when it's these clean CGI images swinging through more CGI images, dodging CGI things, I just couldn't get into it as much. But that might be a generational thing. Music is another thing that we should talk about here. Uh, oh, my God. <laughs> just You guys go ahead first. <laughs> I loved two things of the music in the movie. Um, and a lot of the other ones, now that I'm listening back to the soundtrack, I'm just kind of skipping by and going, Man, well, I'm not going to keep that. Um, but I loved the music at the funeral scene. Are you talking score or soundtrack here? Both. Okay. All combined in one. Um, I like the music that they had playing during the funeral scene and the grieving of passage of time that the let, let her go thing that I had mentioned before. And the main theme that Hans Zimmer made um, that triumphant trumpet uh, kind of song. I think that that's actually one of the best comic book themes that we've had in a long, long time. And something that bothers me about a lot of these movies is they've gotten into this rut now where they feel like they don't need to have a theme that you can actually kind of like hum. And I like when you can. So, for instance, one of the movies that uh, has a really great theme that you can hum along is the first Batman movie. You know, everybody fucking remembers that. Superman, amazing. And I mean, it got to the point where when they did that, uh, the Brian Singer movie, it was just like, oh, well, we need to keep the Superman theme because hell, it practically says Superman in it. You know, it's Superman, da 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 da. And these different themes are really something that can make or break a lot of different stuff here. Uh, the first Captain America movie had a theme that I could remember when I left the movie theater. And even though I do like the soundtrack for Captain America, the winter soldier, that's one thing that I think it was a little bit annoying is there wasn't some kind of a, a theme to sing along. Um, the first Spider-Man movie that we have for this new series didn't have that. Um, it had a theme that was supposed to do that with James Horner, but it wasn't good enough. I think um, James Horner is a really, really good composer and he knows what he's doing for a lot of different stuff. His work on the Lord of the Rings series is ridiculously good, but I don't think he was the right choice for Spider-Man and Hans Zimmer has been killing it with a lot of this stuff. And even though you know this new Batman series that came out didn't have a theme that you could really hum along with because you can't just go hum with do 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 over and over again, this was such a great differentiation where he finally could do something emotional and uplifting. And every time that they played this theme in this, whether it was the actual theme or some kind of a, a different version of it, I had that stuck in my head. And I'm literally leaving the movie theater and I'm sitting there thinking to myself, bum, 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 bum. Yeah. I'm going to listen to that so much. And that's going to be one of my favorite comic book themes for a long, long time in the future. 
other than those two themes, the, the, a lot of the music either bothered me because it was just so, so over the top and heavy handed, or it was something that I didn't really pay that much attention to. Dace? I really like that song by Nickelback. It was good. <laughs> what was that song? Hero. Oh, from the 2000 <laughs> movie. And they say that hero will save us. Not gone. Yeah, that song's awesome. Makes you want to like jump out windows and turn around and pretend like you have spider webs, but then die. <laughs> you don't. You bleed out the nose because Spider-Man didn't catch you in time. <laughs> what have you learned, children? What have you learned? <laughs> Uh, when it comes to the music, the only thing that like freaked me out was the electros. <laughs> like, holy shit, what's going on? Because you're, I mean, when you're watching it in XD, the sound's coming from all angles, man. <laughs> and it was just like, par- I felt paranoid. I was getting ready to shock people in the stadi- studio or wherever the fuck we were. It's coming from the left, it's coming from the right. What the fuck <laughs> are they actually saying? Yeah. I couldn't get past that. Okay, I, I spent like the last three minutes searching because I hate pop music. Philip Phillips, Gone, Gone, Gone. Which one was that? That was the, the song that came on when he was upset and then decided to have an impromptu. Apparently, Peter Parker has given up on Bing. And he had an impromptu Google search to try to find stuff out about his parents. And they had that montage of him making that map. Huh. I'm not going to play the song because I know it's like copyrighted, but it's that song. For you. For oh, you. Oh, yeah. God. Yeah, that was stupid. That was terrible. Yeah. And, and I know it because the lyrics say, even long after you're gone, like, I will carry on. Some fucking executive heard that song. Wow, this fits perfectly. <laughs> Amazing. Oh, that's the title of the movie. Wow. Oh, well, God, real quick reference. I did, did not like that line in the movie of, they should call you the amazing Spider-Man. Turn to camera. Wink, wink. Nudge, <laughs> nudge. <laughs> that only works if you have, like, a news reporter go, look at that. That's the amazing Spider-Man. Like... Well, at least the radio didn't cut out when he said it like Superman. Your name's Super... No, we're still embarrassed of our characters. <laughs> <laughs> Do not say his name on camera. Does that stand for Super... No, it stands for Man of Steel. Man of Steel. That's what she was going to say, everybody. Man of Steel. No more underwear on the outside. Come Gear on. pack. I'm going to go kill like 80 people. <laughs> 80? There's 80 in like the first floor of those buildings. They had like 80 floors. <laughs> so many people are dead now. <laughs> Well, at least, did you guys see Joe Quesada said that uh, General Zod was the real hero of Man of Steel? Yeah, that was great. Oh, my God. I get, I get the competitor thing, but holy crap. That is a um, great podcast, too. If you like our podcast, anybody listening out there, go listen to Fat Man on Batman from Kevin Smith. That is fucking awesome. That is actually yeah. one of the only podcasts that I will listen to every week. So He gets good stuff on there, too. Yeah. So if you're a Batman fan, go listen to that. If you're Marvel only, then you probably won't like it. But at uh-huh. least listen to the Joe Quesada one, because then that's mostly talking about Captain America, the Winter Soldier. But yeah, that montage scene, that music is terrible. That was uh, that should have been a temp track that they added in there as a joke, and then they went, okay, seriously, what, what, what are we actually going to put here? Well, I just can't even get over – I, I kind of mentioned some of the cliches earlier. That research scene, well, now that I've pinned up all the stuff I know about my dad on the wall, okay, you're right where you fucking started. Like, all you've done is dump the puzzle out. <laughs> and, like, it's easier to put the picture on the wall if you just take it out of the frame first instead of using red electrical tape to, like, fast <laughs> into the wall. I don't those whole, those whole sequences to me are just, what is Roosevelt? I don't know. And was it just me or did you totally know there was something inside the calculator? When he, like, picked up the, calc- uh, the calculator made the point of, like, make that friendly face, hmm, nothing here, and toss it aside. I was like, well, now I know where the secrets are. <laughs> But that whole montage to me is just like, well, I haven't Googled my dad in a couple weeks. For you. <laughs> that and like that whole like computer, like everyone has a computer now. Our, our phones are computers. I don't need a montage of people's fingers typing things. That's no longer interesting. That was kind of cool in like 2004. But we're done now. I don't, I don't even know if 2004, I think like 1998. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Not everybody had a computer and it was like, we're going to look this up on the World Wide Web. No, you can't. Let's Hang click on, on here. Let's do the overly loud, exaggerated keyboarding sounds so you know that we're typing something. <laughs> hey, 24 made a franchise on those sounds. <laughs> but the it, uh, the music stuff with that, yeah, that, that was that was over the top and bad. Um, I, there was also... Um, well, was that actually the same scene where he had the music in his earphones? Is that what I'm thinking of? Where he, he lays down in the bed and he's got the music playing. I think it was. 
I know that something bothered me. Yeah, it might actually still be the same scene. I yeah, just... he gets up and shuts the door to the closet like twice, and then he rips the door open and says, "Hey, I'm going to make a collage." <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Which does that ever help anybody out? Has anybody no. ever tried that? Like just putting shit on a wall, and that makes you solve a mystery better. No. It doesn't don't... work with me if I'm like, man, how do I figure out this like HTML code, or how do I figure out what to write on this story, or something like that? Let me just cut out a bunch of snippets of stuff and put it on the wall, then it'll make sense to me. Like I know it's representational for the movie and you know, when we talk about movie tropes and stuff, it's like the general audience has no idea what a trope is, let alone what tropes they specifically are. Right. But that they themselves are tropes. Right. So there's you know, you, you play to the general audience instead of the people that know that kind of stuff, but at the same time I mean, come on with the whole, the, let's have this all hanging up and have strings that lead to different things and all that. It's like, really, realistically, people don't do that. People just open up like a Word document or something like that. Just, but that's, notes, next, that shit. that's the next step with these movies, though. I mean, I think that's how they're going to last. I think that's them getting rid of these tropes, even if the main audience doesn't see it. That's how this goes from a phase to a new genre. You know, Dark Knight got an Oscar, Winter Soldier, I think... I objectively think was an e- excellent film, not as a fan. Like, that's a movie that people are going to want to see because it's interesting. It says things about our time period. Like I think when you keep adding these tropes of little kids in front of guns and these weird research things, like I, I think that's when the movie starts getting bogged down because then, then we're not swinging for the fences anymore. You're just swinging for cash. Any other topics about music? We still have a couple characters to break down that are quick cameos. Yeah. Stuff. Yeah, go go ahead off music. All right, we talked about Donald Menken a little bit, whoever the fuck that is. Asher <laughs> Kafka, whoever that isn't. Uh, <laughs> two quick people that work for Oscorp. Alistair Smythe, who was played by BJ Novak, who I don't really recognize from anything, but I know I recognize that name. He's from uh, The Office. I hate The Office. <laughs> so That explains that. Yeah. <laughs> I saw... Two episodes of the British one and two or three episodes of the English one, uh, the American one, and all of them, I was just like, nope, don't like it. I mean, I can see the appeal, but uh, that's another discussion. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and Gustav Fears, who everybody at the end of the first movie was like, oh my god, who is this mysterious man? Is that like Norman Osborn? Is that Mysterio? Is that fucking Electro because of the, the lightning? No, it's the gentleman. The gentleman! <laughs> He does have a hat on. I hope he returns in the third one because I'm just going to scream it every time he's there. <laughs> oh my gosh. The now, gentleman. I, now I really want to see that hat that he's wearing come onto his head in the same <laughs> kind of how right brother move. Um, so, oh, uh, Alistair Smythe, cool. I uh, remember him a lot from the animated series. Hope he turns into a weird freak with a bunch of extra appendages. And, Shoulder uh, lasers. Right, shoulder laser. What a stupid ass idea. But of course, it was the '90s, and you know everybody had fucking laser beams, and you couldn't punch anybody. And cops had laser pistols instead of guns because you can't have bullets. Pew pew. It's but, a really if you if you have both if one of your hands isn't a gun, then you got to have them somewhere. <laughs> Just throw them on the shoulder. Like handguns. And the people who bought your shoulder lasers. But the um, the inclusion of that, I thought that was cool. Kind of in the same regards as Victor Zaz from Batman of Again. So I just like when they do that. And that wasn't an issue with like the Felicia Hardy thing where it was like, oh, you didn't do anything with Alistair Smythe. Fuck that. <laughs> like, you, you know, they could have added Miles Warren in there and he could have been one of the people working on the, um, the Lizard Project. And I would have thought that that was cool. Uh, but the gentleman is not a character that I'm familiar with. I really don't know anything about him except for stuff that I just read on like Wikipedia after the fact that he, he has something to do with building the sinister sticks, which I mean, we'll talk about that in a minute, but uh, those two characters, what do you guys think about them days? Yeah, they were nice little Easter eggs. Yeah, At just, least in my opinion, just nothing more. Tom. Um, I was really excited to see Smythe as a fan of the nineties show. I think the spider slayers could make a good uh, kind of one of those little one-off, here they are, but then they disappear things. Like an opening scene of... Yeah, just something, something where like, I could see that being... Especially with the comedy thing, like a bunch of guys like, yeah, like we're half a half a trillion dollars into these things, but they're going to take Spider-Man out, and we're going to... And they just kick their ass. Oh, you know. 
giant like, robot oh, just don't work. Oh fuck! This is as clunky as the rhino suit that makes no <laughs> sense at all. How ridiculous did that look next to all the other things? Right. You've got the streamlined suit for the goblin thing, and you're working on tentacles, which is like the tentacle thing. Okay, they're basically just arms. Makes sense. Vulture wings. You know, you're clean, trying to look. They're folded point. up. They're dynamic. Right, and then you're like this fucking monstrosity. <laughs> Half a rhino held up by chains. With these little itty bitty arms and stuff like the, that. <laughs> T-Rex arms. Really fucking weird. Uh, but Smythe, yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't mind seeing Smythe somewhere else. But again, like I think with like something Arrow shown us with like the doll maker and stuff like that. Like oh yeah, like if you do little things with these guys. Again, it just puts us in that world. As for what's his name, Mister Fever. Gustav Fears. Gustav Fears. Well, I mean, as someone who's, who's a huge comic fan and stuff like that, I'll, I'll be honest and say I have no idea who he is, nor am I particularly interested. Just because he's this guy that walks around with a, with a menacing briefcase filled with terrors I can only begin to imagine. <laughs> he's not <laughs> gentleman. <laughs> he's literally carrying around the briefcase from Pulp Fiction. and <laughs> the, gen- the gentleman holds the door open too long, so all your air conditioning gets out. <laughs> <laughs> he carries around the Pulp Fiction briefcase, which ties into Captain America: The Winter Soldier, <laughs> and that's how they bridge the Avengers and Spider-Man universe. Well, that or the gentleman's a clear uh, sign of a crossover with Fifty Shades of Grey next summer. <laughs> <laughs> Freaky. Yeah, but otherwise, he, he didn't do too much to get me excited. But maybe that's because again, that ridiculous giant, like uh, hungry, hungry hippos, rhino, thing <laughs> and that pen, which it clearly didn't fit in. <laughs> like that looks like, look like a bad like MS paint job. Like someone just drew, like dropped that picture there. <laughs> well, that brings up the Sinister Six. Now, I thought before when they had announced years and years and years ago that they wanted to do a Venom movie and it was going to be rated R and he was going to fight Carnage. That that could be cool, but it makes more sense for Venom to be in a Spider-Man movie. Then we got <laughs> Venom in a Spider-Man movie. And it was terrible, and that's because Sam Raimi doesn't like Venom, so he was just like, fuck this thing, I'm gonna make this all about Sandman. Uh, <laughs> My spidey yeah. sense is tingling, if you know what I mean. Yeah. They're is like, it really you have to say that? You know who'd be good in the Spider-Man movie? Fucking Venom. Right, one of like <laughs> the most important, best, coolest fucking characters out of any Spider-Man story ever. And then Sam Raimi's like, I want Sandman, damn it. <laughs> but Penny... Hey, can I get Sandman and Vulture? I'm only interested in 1965 Spider-Man. <laughs> you will use Shitty Goblin and Sandman, and you will be happy. Right. Well, I'm going to make it suck now. It's like, you know hey, what? Do that dance you do when you're drunk. <laughs> <laughs> Fine. If you really want to make me have to do Green Goblin, he's going to be nothing like Green Goblin. He's going to be a skateboarder, and he's going to wear stupid goggles. He's going to forget Tony about it for a while. We're going to have Venom, but he's only going to look like Tover Grace the entire time, who really would have been a better Spider-Man than anybody else. <laughs> uh, but after that, a lot of people are like, oh, well, Venom can't be done in movies. Bullshit. Venom can't be done by Sam Raimi. Venom <laughs> can be done by a hell of a lot of other people out there. And well, uh, I thought originally that they might add Venom into this kind of mix um, for these movies, but it, now that they have announced that they're going to do another Venom movie, or, well, a Venom movie... Maybe that's the best route to go. Just make him the main character. You can cast somebody who is hopefully young enough, but not too young enough um, to pull the part off. Have him fight Carnage and the Life Foundation or something like that. That can make a decent movie. Sinister Six? What the fuck are they thinking with this? Uh, that is kind of the equivalent of what DC has said that they want to do, where they want to do a Suicide Squad movie. And maybe you can pull that off on comic book stuff, but you can't do that as a movie and make it turn out well. I think you add a Sinister Six movie to the mix and it's not revolving around Spider-Man. Bomb. I think that's a great way to put the brakes on the amazing uh, franchise. Because especially how... Like... That's just gonna be so expensive. Six characters to do all because let's. I mean, pretty much all uh, they didn't and they left out like Craven the Hunter and anybody who could be cheap. I mean, there's no way all those guys don't require heavy CG and are not even like the Suicide Squad or got are like C-list villains who've been captured and are essentially just greedy assholes. So like, listen, we're not gonna give you the death sentence. Just 
repay your debt to, to society by going on suicidal missions that are so dangerous. Like, there's character work there. Like, the Sinister Sticks are just, like, a- like assholes. Like, right. How much depth is there to Paul Giamatti's Rhino character? Not that I love Paul Giamatti. He should be knighted. But, you know, there's not – I don't know. I just don't see any depth there to hold up a movie. And I can't see these three people or the gentleman. The gentleman! <laughs> I specifically waited an extra second. <laughs> Or Alistair Smythe, considering how much of an ass he is in this, too. I can't see any of them having any kind of heroic deeds whatsoever. I mean, if you're going to do somebody in the Sinister Six that can have some th- kind of heroism to them, maybe you can go with Doc Ock. Maybe you can go with Craven. And, okay, Harry Osborn might be able to turn good. But, fuck, like, how do you turn rhino into a fucking hero or how do you introduce vulture and make him a hero who do they fight in the movie for that yeah, fu- who fucking else are you sake? gonna get like you i can't see them building a movie around this i really have no idea what they're planning and i can't imagine any scenario where this turns out okay i thought i just read there's supposed to be details at comic-con this summer because did you guys know about that whole if he shazammed the song from the closing soundtrack you got to see those six pictures of the sinister six who were the six that they showed? Um, well, again, they were these really tight shots of ambiguous things. So you saw like these like metallic feathers. So it's vulture. You saw tentacle claw thing. You saw rhino horn. You saw like kind of these gun barrel slots that look like they should be on the glider. Um, I remember the only I forget what the fifth one was. I remember the only real mystery one was there was this tight shot of something that could have been chameleon or Mysterio. Hmm. And there was a noticeable lack of a bowler, a derby, or a briefcase, <laughs> <laughs> indicating the most much beguiled gentleman. The gentleman. <laughs> um, it better not be a chameleon. Yeah, I didn't stay through the credits because my mom was so confused um, about the idea of end credit stuff, or just about no the movie. about about what she just watched for two and a half hours, <laughs> and that people can die now in TV. <laughs> <laughs> like they killed off the girl the sweet little girl what happened yeah but um so i i don't know about any other post sequence stuff but yeah i'm really at a loss for where where that's supposed to be going or what i can see sinister sticks being a big crescendo for a trilogy and i even i was kind of hoping they were going to go the whole uh harry osborne venom thing uh, again because dane is dane dehan's such a great actor um and also well I don't know. Then we have to get into this whole conversation about how really strange, like what exactly heals him. Because I feel like he didn't have to go through all of that if he could have just jumped inside that suit. But anyway, um, yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm kind of just at a lot. As someone who's a huge Spider-Man fan, I have no idea. No clue. What do you think they're going to do, Dace? It's just like they're, we're going to have like uh, what we were joking around at the movie theater, uh, of a movie of Sinister Six where they, in the first 20 minutes, they're all sitting around a bar and they go, so... I can kill more people than you. No, bullshit. Okay, well, for the next two and a half hours, we're going to have a contest. Whoever kills most people wins. And then fucking and Superman Donald just shows up and it's over. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I honestly don't know what they're going to do with this. And I don't even know if it's going to garner enough interest from those of us outside of the comic community. Yeah. Like, everybody everybody who's not a comic fan knows Spider-Man. So they're going to go see Spider-Man, regardless of if he's fighting. If these are six guys that he fights in, like, one-off comics and stuff like that, I don't think it's going to get the same popularity. Kind of the thing that made me a little bit nervous with Guardians of the Galaxy. Because nobody I, knows who they are. I think it has that Phantom Menace thing going on, too, going like with the Star Wars trilogies. Who's going to be your main character? Mm-hmm. Like, you have to have that focal point. I mean, even even this movie, even... I mean, Winter Soldier had great character arts for Anthony Mackie, for Scarlett Johansson, even for um, for Fury. Like, they'd had some great character work. But it was still Chris Evans' story. Mm-hmm. Whereas you get this, these six people on char- on screen, I just see it. Unless it's like a, like a goofy like action movie where you embrace that this is just popcorn. But there's no way you make a movie like that. You make back the money on a budget it would take to make six characters like that on the big screen maybe Harry is going to be the main character and maybe they'll back. use that as like Dane DeHaan. This is a vehicle for him to be the lead, but man, I, that, that just seems like a recipe for disaster. 
I think Harry just turned into such a bad person. Like he had one neck scab, and it's like, well, head's got to start rolling because I got to get it. <laughs> <laughs> it's like my hands shake a little research. bit. Uh, I'm pretty sure I have to start pulling a gun out on people. <laughs> yeah, right. Like my eyes are getting really puffy. I need something now. Well, my blood doesn't work. Well, let me try this stuff and this stuff. Oh, they work perfectly. <laughs> oh, man. I wish I would have just gotten into this suit earlier. <laughs> well, that's like another one of these things. It's like this suit gives you like auto healing and increased like physical agility. Like, what does that mean? What does that mean? It fixes you on the inside. This is our special fixing suit. We spent all of our <laughs> money into this. And that's why Rhino looks the way that Rhino looks. <laughs> You see this little slot here? It pumps out script pages, so it tells you what to do when you're wearing... Oh, wow. This is great. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Just get out of here. I don't know. I, I, I'd like to see him get Venom or something, but... But then what do you do in the, in the last Spider-Man movie? What do you do in Amazing Spider-Man 3? Yeah, because you can't do Venom and have Venom die or anything like that, because then you have the Venom movie. You can't do Sinister Six and then do a Sinister Six movie without... Yeah, the Shocker. Hey, yeah, it's going to be like Shocker and uh, fucking um, Craven. Like, I really, I have no idea what they could do. I mean, there's Swarm. a lot of villains out there, but a lot of villains you can't build a movie around. Swarm, guy made of bees. Right, Swarm. <laughs> he took Just, the peg down. Be like, oh, okay, we, that, we took I think that. They Sandman, that was the fifth one in that, um, that Shazam picture preview thing. I hope not, Sandman. I don't want more Sandman. I mean, Sandman's nope. okay for different stuff, but he shouldn't have even been in the first series. Let alone if, they, thing. if they have Sandman, they need to get new music people, or there will be a scene where they stumble into a Metallica concert. Because <laughs> 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 these are the most ham-fisted people that pick the music. Well, I really can't think of anybody. I mean, maybe that's a chance to do something really outside the box. Um and include none of those characters for that it would be in Sinister Six, like the Doc Ock and the uh, Rhino and Mysterio and all that. Maybe that is a chance to do something like Morlin. Yeah. Um, Who would you say? Morbius? Oh, fuck Morbius. The hell with that. Only vampires. <laughs> Actually, yeah, I was going to say, if this was 10 years ago, it would 100% be Morbius. Morbius sorry, should have been like in a movie, ago. if anything else. Um. But we know it's not going to be like we're building the whole third movie around Molten Man or Hydro Man or fucking um, oh Hydro Man the Looter like <laughs> the I Wizard mentioned... the Prowler <laughs> I mentioned fucking uh Big Wheel and Hypno Hustler earlier what if they do Spot Spot <laughs> they like the Spot these days in the comics and watch out we haven't had Spider Mobile yet <laughs> or Mister Negative. Oh, Mr. Negative. <laughs> Mr. Negative's a gentleman sidekick. The gentleman! <laughs> <laughs> They're rounded out by a third villain that they just call Sir. <laughs> kind Sir. <laughs> Mr. and gentleman and kind Sir. <laughs> it sounds like the plot for that 1602 Spider Man. With a terrible three. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I don't know. It'll be interesting. But again, I keep trying to check because it's. Well, it's almost one o'clock here on the East Coast, which means eh, it's still. Oh, what, it's, not even, it's not even ten o'clock in LA. We're not really seeing numbers yet because they should be. They should know soon how this is tracking, and I think that'll change a lot of things. I think if this movie doesn't hit a hundred million this weekend, it's it's going to be an interesting conversation. I got one suggestion if we're talking about stuff for the future that I just thought of right now, and this should not have been a third film, so I don't know if they can pull that off or whatever. I think it should have been a first or second. Well, actually, no, it should have been a second film. Craven and Scorpion. Oh, I forgot about Scorpion. Yeah, they're cool. Scorpion's the main villain. Craven is uh, hunting them both. That kind of thing. Could have worked well, better cool. with uh, Lizard, I think, than Scorpion, but you already did Lizard, so you can't do that again. Um, yeah, Craven oh. and Scorpion, maybe. That would be a, my guess, or somebody like Morlin, or fucking just do Sinister Six and then just don't do the movie. But then you're hitting on the Spider-Man thing. Like, what does what does the Scorpion ever want? Just make him a mindless creature built to hunt Spider-Man or something like that, I guess. I don't know. And then Craven's hunting them both? Sure. But then what's your A story? What's Peter Parker doing? Like, what's the what's the thing? I don't know. I'd have to actually think about that. I'm thinking of just... Throwing, well, I'm, uh, I'm, thinking, I'm just spitballing with yeah. you, but I think that's the, that's the weird thing about Spider-Man's rogues gallery. 
I've always said that if I if somebody said to me, look, you've got full control, you could ignore everything from the past, you can include stuff from the past, what do you want to do for three films? I would say first film, you do origin story and um, the burglar that kills um, Uncle oh, Ben, okay. that all that kind of stuff, and you do Green Goblin. Pretty much the same as what they did in the first Spider-Man. Mm-hmm. Uh, if you don't do that, then you do lizard which they did in this one so i was like oh you know okay uh second movie you do craven and lizard because that is the hunt angle and make it to where he is responsible enough that he knows he has to stop lizard but he doesn't want craven to kill him and craven is going after spider-man too and you don't do the whole like should i give up my powers thing bullshit and it, that never is a decent enough storyline i think and third one, you go with uh, Hobgoblin, Harry Osborn, and Venom. Hobgoblin being Harry Osborn. Um, yeah. But I don't know what they're going to do in this one. Um, but that's something to speculate about. What would you like to see them do, guys? Daisy, you can take it first. I'm, i I got to think about that one for a um, minute. I just wish they would stop. <laughs> well, that's, that's... Go ahead, Daisy. That they should just stop, let the time run out, and let Marvel just do it right. Um, I, I just, I, I want to see him versus like a Venom Carnage because Venom is just awesome. But at the same time, I, I don't. They tried to pack too much into this one to the point where I think they're gonna, they're just blowing themselves up to the point where they won't be able to uh, perform in the third one. Any ideas, well, I- Tom? Yeah, I think well, I think they threw so much in this one because they know this one's got either got a hit or it's over. Because I, I think with th- this movie, I mean Hollywood accounting, it's hard to figure out what anything costs. But this movie, they probably put over three hundred million into. So if this thing's not a smash hit, I could see them being open to being bought out from Marvel. But um, I mean, see, you, you took away um, Science Peter, so you can't really do like a doppelganger thing in the last one. I mean, the only place you could re- the the only turf they could, I see they could really go is to do some kind of Venom story. Um, I always thought Hobgoblin was interesting, um, maybe Scorpion, but again, a lot of Spider-Man villains are almost like accessories to somebody, mm-hmm. and it's lacking a lot of that somebody. I feel like like I don't know who, that, especially without access to any other Marvel uh, Rogues Gallery, the fact that you can't have Kingpin, you know, to kind of be orchestrating any of these things. I, mean, I guess you could try to do something with. Um, I wonder if they have. They probably have the rights to Tombstone, right? I think so. Or Hammerhead. You could do Hammerhead and Tombstone, and that they're the ones that are orchestrating this whole thing. Silvermane. Silvermane. That'd be another cool one. They did build something out there where they said that Oscorpus some kind of ties to uh, some kind of criminal organization, but they didn't say what. Yeah, well, I thought it was like. Didn't they say it was just like some like like uh, military thing? It might have been that. Because that's why they were making the. I assume that's the only reason they'd be inventing gun, rhino gun suits. Because <laughs> <laughs> the government was like, yeah, we went to uh, went to the Serengeti, and you know, we went all around the world and started looking at animals, and we thought it was pretty badass. Rhinos. <laughs> he was like rhinos, but with a gun. <laughs> Well, I'd love to be in that pitch meeting, too. It's like, oh, man, Richard, we're out of funding for our, our breakthrough genetics medicine research. Well, let's see what the Russians want. All right, guys, what do you want for unlimited funding? We want rhinos. <laughs> you want what? <laughs> rhinos with guns. Okay, well, we don't know if we can actually give I mean, them guns and teach them how to use them, but no, we want we want metal rhinos with guns. We're trying to invent the cure for cancer. You think you cannot make rhino with gun? <laughs> I mean... We'll try. It's going to cost a lot of money. Yes, this is easy. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, All right. Let's take some of our uh, resources out of that magical healing suit. That's a a dead end project. (laughs) Yeah, right. (laughs) (laughs) Let's just go make a pair of wings that are green. (laughs) You know, it's one thing I wanted to talk about. I thought that was cool about this movie um, because we kind of talked about the Marvel thing. I thought this movie did the PTSD thing way better than Iron Man 3 did. What do you mean? With the um, well, so Iron visions Man, of... Yeah, the visions of her and that guilt. I think that's why I like the beginning so much because you really... Because one of the things I hate about the first Spider-Man movie is 
Peter Parker is the ultimate likable character, right? He's the person we can all see ourselves in. All right, one of my mentors on your deathbed. I promise to stay away from your daughter. <laughs> Promises are made to be broken. <laughs> be you. I was like, wow, what an asshole. I hope I hope that Madam Web brings him back to life and he just kicks Spider Man's ass. Um, telling you, hello, Mirren. <laughs> tell your friends. But um, in this movie, I think I think because again, the way that you keep the fantastic rooted in reality without being super broody like DC and all the blah, crazy dark soundtrack is by making it realize like that guy just saw, he, he's an 18 year old kid who watched someone dive in front of his eyes. And the fact that he's seeing this guy places and he knows he can't live with what happened. I think that's a good plot line. Whereas Iron Man three, it's I'm the world's leading genius. Aliens just invaded my planet. Oh my gosh. I should have seen this coming. Drawings give me flashbacks, but flying in the suit that I fought the aliens and doesn't. <laughs> it's like I just thought I, th- I thought that was like and then then the little kid tells him to fix himself and he says okay because little kids equals dollars money money just pouring out of kids mouths like a Chuck E. Cheese machine ding 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 yeah, at but, least he didn't uh, wear a mini Iron Man suit and stand up to the fake Mandarin in that <laughs> no, but he, no but he did Iron Man did give the little kid some piece of ammunition to shoot at people <laughs> responsible <laughs> Yeah, right? Like, I don't know. I, I, I just, I mean, we never really got to talk about Iron Man 3, which I didn't like at all. But um, I just thought this movie really sold that PTSD thing better. Because I thought, I thought the character work at the beginning was good. I just thought, I think there, there could have been two good movies out of what they told in the second part of that movie. There was just so much stuff going on there. But I thought, I thought the, the PTSD regret from the passing was better than Iron Man 3. So I think we pretty much touched on everything that I was thinking about doing. Um, is there anything, other topics that you guys wanted to talk about, Dace? No, I think I'm good. Tom? Um, I think the one last thing is going off what we just said, kind of what Dace brought up. So five Spider-Man movies in 12 years. Are we just, do we just need a break from the wall crawler? I don't think so. <sighs> I think uh, what you need, though, is you just need a clear direction and you need when this series is over with, whatever it ends up happening, um, hopefully it doesn't end in as bad of a kerfuffle or whatever you could say as Spider-Man 3 did. Uh, I think you don't reboot and do the origin. I think that Spider-Man's in a weird territory where, like, the Batman movies, we had this these four movies that were the same continuity, and then enough time passed, and everybody was just like, we cannot have the same continuity with these. We need <laughs> something new. That people were really receptive to Batman Begins. And Superman, you know it's a brand new universe. Uh, more than enough time has passed with that, because Superman Returns barely fucking counts. Um <laughs> That people were willing to just go with a new continuity. Shame that it sucks, but uh, <laughs> X Men is still doing the same thing. They still are from you know 1999 pulling the same continuity out there. Well, they're they're figuring out eating it too. Yeah, but they're figuring out a way to kind of have both of the best of the different worlds. Spider Man's the only one that we've ever really had where we've had a reboot happened so fast after the other ones have happened that the first thing everybody was saying was, well, they're not going to do the origin, right? Because we just went through the Spider-Man movie. And that kind of bothered a lot of people for the first one. If they do that again in like, I don't know, six years or something like that, people will be just so over the character at that point that I don't think that's worth it. I think at that point you go with something where you just kind of stick right into Spider-Man and you just go... Let's just do Spider-Man. And the beginning of the film, he's Spider-Man. And now Spider-Man does shit. Like, but I think the next logical step needs to be that they need to go over to Marvel. I don't think at the end of this series there is any chance whatsoever that Spider-Man doesn't just get sent over to Disney. I just whether they're willing to buy him out, really, because it's how, how do you say, especially when <clears throat> two of Marvel's movies are the top five grossing movies ever, how, how do you say what the value of these characters are? That's why I think this one needs to be very mediocre for them to be open to that talk. 
What do you think, Days? People, people sick of Spider Man? Uh, I just feel like ever since Marvel did the Avengers, when everybody kind of like scoffed at them, now the other studios are rushing to open up the same kind of universe and they're ruining the other franchises by doing so because they didn't. I feel like phase one, even though it took so long, it was long enough that when we got the Avengers, it was like awesome. <laughs> now it's like, well, we got to do this in half the time and let's push everything out as we possibly can and give them every single character ever. I think it's just going to kill the franchise and we're going to be tired of Spider-Man, unfortunately, sooner than later. Yeah, that's a good way to put it. Any other topics you guys want to uh, touch upon? I'm good. I think we yeah. kind of covered everything. I always want to talk about that fucking oboe again. <laughs> <laughs> so pissed. Oboe man, oboe man. Oh, yeah, real quick re- reference the music. I thought it was cool that he was using the Spider-Man theme as his ringtone. Yeah, mm-hmm. that's fun. But really, cause it's, it's like what Daisha said. When you have a single character trying to build a whole universe, there's just really no, not that much room for Easter eggs. <clears throat> not in the way that we, we're used to getting excited about them. Although, you know what someone said to me when I was going to this? Did you think in Winter Soldier when it said a high school valedictorian that that could have been an unnamed Peter Parker? A high school valedictorian? What did they say that in there? Um, when they're doing that thing where they're going, they're like naming off all the people on the list. Um, I think it was Sitwell who said it's when he he he, go, he names a bunch of these people. He's like, but I'm in a high school valedictorian, Stephen Strange. Like it, it's in a list. It's one of the spoken ones, though. Maybe, maybe. Um... I thought that could be a cool thing that if if maybe they think there's a chance they're getting this thing back that they they stunk that in there. Maybe some kind of a reference to Ultimate Reed Richards. Yeah, that's true. Maybe. Oh my God! Talk about train wrecks. Only yeah. a movie to come put everything in perspective. Yeah. No, no, Fast no. forward to whenever we end up covering that movie on a, on a group meeting podcast. That's gonna blow. <laughs> Actually, yeah. Let me get this on record now. I if that movie sucks. I called it first. Boom. On <laughs> Tom Jackson, I'm, that movie sucks. I'm not going to go watch it. No? No. I refuse <laughs> to give them money. They need to learn their lesson. That might be my first uh, New York City bootleg. <laughs> <laughs> Just to support the local economy. The fantastic works. We'll see if that thing even gets to the theater. Now that we know we got Mole Man to look forward to. <laughs> Mole Man leader. Yeah. <laughs> uh. There is going to be, uh, I'm speaking of transitioning to the plug section here, um, there is going to be another talk that we're going to have with comic book movies. Later on this month, we're going to try to do an X-Men Days of Future Past group meeting review, but we're also going to try to do our first ever episode of Fan Tracks, where we do commentary through the episodes of the 90s animated series that covered Days of Future Past. So if you are interested in stuff like riff tracks, kind of related things, but not necessarily just we watch bad things, make jokes about it. This is uh, more from the fan perspective and explaining things we liked about this kind of stuff. That is going to be coming up, commentary fan tracks. You'll check that out on this same YouTube channel, and uh, we will do that on iTunes and Stitcher as well. Uh, The other plugs that I can throw out there for Fanboys Anonymous that um, are in the same kind of vein... Obviously, go to fanboysanonymous.com, follow us on Facebook and Twitter, and other A Mango Tree related projects and other Fanboys Anonymous related projects and other things that you'll find on Mega Powers Radio and anything else affiliated with us. There is a ton of different ways that you can find the information out there. The main things are on Facebook and on the websites themselves, so go check them out. You'll stumble across a lot of different stuff that you're interested in. And, hey, maybe you even want to be a contributor or something like that. If you do, send in an application and stay tuned to everything else that's coming your way from from us. Passing along here, Tom, plugs. Uh, I'm just a contributor for Fanboys Anonymous. Uh, and I'm also an editor for The Real Deal movie site. That's TheRealDealIansBlog.com. Dace. Follow me on Twitter at the Dace Man and check me out Wednesday nights on Mega Powers Radio hosting the Dace Man Show. We also have another episode of the For Real Movie Club coming up. That is uh, what date is that? Day? That is May eighteenth, and we're going to be covering monster movies, if I remember correctly. Well, yes. giant monster movies, not horror movies, but in time for the new Godzilla movie, which does look pretty cool. <sighs> so, uh. For 
everybody on the panel this evening and for myself. Thank you guys for joining in. Thank you guys for listening. If you're out there in viewer land, I'm Tony Mango and better good. I'm going to be a fanboy for life for Spider-Man. This meeting is adjourned. See you next time, everybody.